continue the important work of considering reforms to our energy permitting system and the state of energy on our public lands and waters. Permitting reform is essential for more reliable and affordable energy and to make our country more secured and competitive. Congress took a meaningful step towards forward in June with the Fiscal Responsibility Act, the debt deal, with several common sense reforms that I know had bipartisan support from our committee members. That included firm deadlines to complete reviews, requirements that agencies work simultaneously on a single environmental review and several others. But there's still much more to do. Our committee is uniquely situated to be able to make real progress by coming together in a bipartisan fashion around a targeted set of top priorities for both Democrats and Republicans. We had a constructive hearing on overall energy permitting reform way back in May. And today we're going to drill deeper on some of our committee members, top priorities based on the various permitting bills that have been referred to us. This includes responsibly addressing issues that are slowly slowing down or blocking energy infrastructure critical for energy security and reliability, like pipelines and transmission lines. That discussion will be coupled with one on leasing and permitting of all types of energy on federal land and in federal waters, which is a tremendous energy resource and a critical piece of our jurisdiction. Let me begin with transmission. Over the last year, there has been an attempt to paint transmission permitting reform as just another subsidy for intermittent renewable energy. If that were the case, that would be very hard for a lot of us to support. But this is simply not true. And we should not politicize infrastructure that has long enjoyed bipartisan support. Here are the facts as I see them. Number one, big interstate transmission lines just aren't getting built. In 2021, we had the lowest build out of extra high voltage transmission construction in the last decade. Number two, the process of siting, paying for, and planning large interstate interregional transmission is different from other types of infrastructure and requires unique fixes. Number three, the transmission is a key electric, electric reliability tool, particularly during weather events that span hundreds of miles. Long distance transmission and interconnectivity enables power to move to where it's needed. As we've seen in Texas and other parts of the country, the areas that need to power aren't just blue states with aggressive climate targets and some of us may not agree with. Of course, transmission infrastructure alone isn't enough for reliability. We also need dispatchable generation like coal, natural gas, hydropower, and nuclear. But without transmission, that generation has nowhere to go and it can't help the areas that really need it. Let me be clear, states are currently in the driver's seat on transmission projects. And I believe in most cases, that's where decisions should be made. But in the limited instances where there is a project that is in the national interest and it gets stuck at the state level, we need an efficient federal backstop to provide a pathway for the project to get the permits and be fairly paid for based on benefits received. The solution set for other types of energy projects looks different than transmission. And one critical element which wasn't included in the debt deal that would benefit all types of energy projects from pipelines to offshore wind to mining projects are judicial reforms. In my home state of West Virginia, just one project, the Mountain Valley Pipeline, has faced dozens of lawsuits in the five plus years since they received all necessary federal permits. While the debt deal shrunk NEPA review timelines down to no more than two years, as we all know, litigation on the back end can add many more years to the permitting process after agencies have completed their work. There are three stages of the litigation process that we should look at streamlining, the filing, the case, and the remedy. On the first issue right now, in many cases, parties can file suit and begin litigation up to six years, I repeat, up to six years after a permit has been issued, allowing three times as long to challenge a NEPA review as we're allowing for agencies to issue one. Now, this makes no sense at all. The second issue is the length of the court case itself. Given how behind we are building the energy infrastructure this country needs for our security, Congress should direct the courts to expedite proceedings for these projects. Third is what happens if a court sends a permit back to an agency for more work. Usually when a court sends a permit back, it identifies a few specific issues that must be fixed. Yet we have agencies taking almost as long on these fixes as it took them to write the whole permit from scratch. All of these parts of the judicial process can and should be structured so that everyone gets their day in court. But project developers of all kinds have more certainty. Our second panel today will discuss how we can bring some timelines 
certainty and efficiency to building and producing on federal lands and waters. We need to be clear about what we mean by permitting here because the conversation tends to blur two distinct steps. Whether it's an oil and gas well in New Mexico, a solar project in Arizona, geothermal Nevada, offshore wind off the coast, uh, California coast, or an oil and gas platform in the Gulf of Mexico, the first step is to navigate the Department of the Interior's leasing and right-of-way process. Then there's the separate process of getting permits to build or drill on that particular lease. Both steps have environmental reviews and approval processes, each with litigation risk. Energy producers on federal lands and waters, like those on private or state lands, want legal certainty about their leases, a steady flow of future sales to justify long-term investments in infrastructure and skilled workforces. Continued production of these federal resources is incredibly beneficial, not just to our energy security, but also to fund Western state priorities like education and national priorities like the Land and Water Conservation Fund. I've been concerned about efforts by the administration to throttle back oil and gas leasing and production, so I made sure that the Inflation Reduction Act tied the ability to issue wind and solar leases to whether or not Interior is holding significant oil and gas lease sales, both on and offshore. And because that's now the law, the unprecedented delay in finalizing the next five-year offshore oil and gas plan is now putting both offshore wind and offshore oil and gas at risk. On top of that, just last week, the administration and environmental groups released a voluntary settlement agreement negotiated behind closed doors that would take 11 million acres in the Gulf off the table from leasing and impose restrictions that only apply to oil and gas leaseholders. If the settlement agreement goes through, you'll have oil and gas vessels barred from operating at night or restricted to slow speeds, while commercial shipping, passenger vessels, and fishermen will be completely unaffected. I don't know if there's a better example of this administration's targeting of American energy production than this. A domestic, a domestic energy provider literally held back while a tanker ship importing foreign crew can cruise on by with unrestrictions. Onshore, while they still have work to do, I'm glad to see that the IRA has pushed BLM to finally resume holding lease sales, including New Mexico's record-setting sale back in May. But as I said, once you've got a lease, you've then got to permit the project itself. I'm interested to hear from our witnesses how Interior's permitting process affects each of their industry. I imagine there's a lot of common challenges regardless of the energy type. As the superpower of the world with the abundant natural resources, a strong workforce, and the ability to produce cleaner than anyone else, there is no reason for us not to have a robust energy production program on our federal lands and waters. As a chairman of this committee, I'm committed to continuing to convene my colleagues for open dialogue and negotiations on how to make more progress on permitting this year. Let me end with some housekeeping since we've got two panels today with two separate topics. For the first hour and a half, we'll have the opening statements and then ask questions of our first panel of witnesses on transmission lines and pipelines. Then we'll hear the opening statements and ask questions of our second panel on energy projects on federal lands and waters. With that, I'm going to turn to my friend Senator Brasso for his opening statement. Well, thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding today's hearing, and I'm so grateful that we continue to pursue meaningful bipartisan permitting reform in this committee. Last month, Congress passed legislation to address spending and the debt ceiling. That legislation included important steps to expedite the review process under NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. It also authorized the Mountain Valley Pipeline. While the legislation was helpful, Congress' work is far from over. Congress still needs to fix the broken leasing and permitting process for oil, natural gas, and coal production on federal land. And we need to ensure that the Mountain Valley Pipeline is not the last major interstate natural gas pipeline ever to be built in America. Under federal law, the Secretary of the Interior is required, required by law, to hold quarterly lease sales in each state with federal oil and gas resources. Since President Biden took office, the Secretary of the Interior has held only two lease sales in these states. That's two lease sales in 10 quarters. That means when it comes to leasing, the Secretary of Interior is violating the law 80% of the time. It is a complete disgrace. 
Oil and gas production on federal lands employs tens of thousands of people in Wyoming and throughout the West. In Wyoming, it pays for K-12 public education and other essential services. It is central to the economics and the economies of rural communities. By failing to hold robust lease sales each quarter, Secretary Holland is setting our states up for failure in the future. That includes her home state of New Mexico, which is among the poorest states in the nation. The Secretary's decision of having a similar impact is having a similar impact on coastal communities. Under current law, Secretary Holland was required to finalize a five-year offshore oil and gas leasing plan by June 30th of 2022. We're now beyond that date of 2023. Instead, she issued a draft plan which included the option of ending all offshore oil and gas leasing altogether. Since then, this secretary has dragged her feet on taking further actions. That almost certainly means that 2024 will be the first year without any offshore oil and gas lease sales in the United States since the mid-1960s. I do not support President Biden's radical and economically disastrous efforts to electrify everything almost immediately. One thing that's necessary is expanding transmission lines to improve the reliability of the electric grid. Such expansions will not happen without permitting. As I've told Chairman Manchin, I'm willing to discuss changes to laws addressing interstate electric transmission lines. We must follow two principles. First, any changes to laws governing transmission must actually address electric reliability. The biggest threat to reliability is not the lack of transmission lines. It is the premature retirement of coal, natural gas, and nuclear power plants. That is what we heard in this committee at that table from experts, including NERC, the, National, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, and FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Second, any changes to laws governing transmission can't be just another subsidy. Congress should not try to force electric customers in rural inland states, such as Wyoming and West Virginia, to subsidize ill-conceived policies of coastal states, such as California and New Jersey. If California, New Jersey, New York want to rely on offshore oil or on offshore wind, then their customers should pay for it. I suggest that we pursue permitting changes that actually put steel in the ground. We should pursue changes in law that will benefit all energy sources and projects, not just those favored by President Biden. And we should pursue changes that help ensure these projects are not defeated in the courts. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to continuing to work with you and other members of this committee on permitting reform. Together, we can improve our nation's economy, restore American energy dominance, and reduce the high cost of energy for American families. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Barrasso, and I'd like to welcome our first panel witnesses to the committee, and thank you all again for coming today. Uh, first, we're going to have uh, Mr. Jason Stanick. Jason is former chairman of the Maryland Public Service Commission. Then we're going to have Mr. Antonio, uh, Antonio Smith, uh, executive vice president, grid solutions and government affairs for AEP, American Electric Power. And then third, we're going to have Mr. Ted Tepley, uh, senior vice president, transmission, Gulf of Mexico with Williams. So we'll start with you, Mr. Stanick. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, and members of the, the committee. As the Chairman just noted, I was the recently departed Chairman of the Maryland Public Service Commission. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on an issue of critical importance. As both a former federal and state utility regulator, I offer you the perspective of one who has seen how the current permitting process impacts and it oftentimes challenges the development of needed energy infrastructure in this country. As our regional power grids face record demands, as our reliability incidents increase seemingly weekly, and as our aging infrastructure nears the end of its useful life, attention to permitting reform can no longer wait. Whether it's developing offshore wind turbines or building new inter-regional transmission lines, the glacial pace of our approvals process is threatening the nation's ability to deliver reliable and affordable energy supplies to our citizens. Of course, when it comes to the permitting of large major infrastructure projects, the federal and state governments have overlapping responsibilities. For its part, the state siting authorities have a responsibility to use best efforts to conduct a thorough review 
and to make a final determination within a reasonable time frame. Project developers, likewise, deserve to know that their applications and proposals will be processed efficiently and without delay. Fortunately, state regulators have tremendous experience with reviewing energy projects and should be viewed as partners when evaluating the need for and siting of energy infrastructure. In turn, it is equally important that federal authorities respect the state's jurisdiction and to provide deference to allow the state processes to run its course, including electing not to exercise backstop authority or otherwise preempt the state from completing a review that is underway and moving towards a final determination. As I noted in my written testimony, if our reforms are to be successful, meaningful consultation and mutual respect between the state and federal regulators will best reflect the spirit of cooperative federalism. I think it will also be essential for permitting reforms to include clear language to include the roles of both the federal and the state regulator when reviewing proposals to cite projects of national interest. Now, beyond streamlining the federal permitting processes, there are other issues that are either slowing or inhibiting the development of energy infrastructure, namely how we plan for new electric transmission lines and how we decide who will pay for them. As the form, former co-chair of the Joint Federal State Task Force on Electric Transmission, I could testify that the need to modernize the way in which we conduct transmission planning ranks very high. Going forward, we will need to employ PIP planning practices that can better project future load growth, that could incorporate state policies from the outset, and anticipate severe and increasingly unexpected weather events and threats to the power system, both cyber and physical. Improving this framework within planning regions and requiring closer coordination between neighboring regions will result in the most efficient development of new transmission lines at the lowest overall cost. Equally important is answering the question of who is going to pay for these new projects. Determining which customers or which states should pay for a particular project has been a challenging exercise for many years. While cost-benefit reviews have historically focused on production cost savings, we now have experience in evaluating a range of other benefits, both broad and narrow, both quantifiable and harder to quantify. But by spreading those costs to a broader class of identified beneficiaries, in a fair and equitable manner, I believe we can remove a formidable barrier to the development of needed transmission lines. I should also note that FERC has several rulemakings currently underway on all of these issues, and state regulators have participated at every stage of these proceedings. Ultimately, the bottom line is that the current regulatory environment facing energy infrastructure developers is challenging under the best of circumstances. With increasing demands on our energy delivery networks, permitting reform is the first step to ensure that our nation can make timely investments to access reliable, affordable, and abundant energy supplies. I emphasize timely because I believe we are running out of time based on current proje projections and trends. Ultimately, having Congress establish protocols that will facilitate state regulators and their federal counterparts to work cooperatively while respecting each other's jurisdiction will result in an efficient permitting process that will get projects built more quickly while strengthening this nation's independence and energy security. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Now, Mr. Smith. Yes, uh, good morning, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, and members of this honorable committee. Thank you for the invitation to testify at today's hearing. Uh, my name is Antonio Smith. I serve as Executive Vice President of Grid Solutions and Government Affairs at American Electric Power, which is one of the largest electric utilities in the United States. We serve 5.6 million customers across an 11-state footprint, and we develop, own, operate, and maintain the largest electric transmission system in North America. First, I want to thank you for your work to streamline and make our country's siting and permitting processes more efficient. We're grateful for your efforts. As you know, our nation's electric system is in the midst of a fundamental transformation driven by an aging grid, as well as changes in both the consumption and the production of energy. The confluence of these changes means far greater complexity for grid operators and planners as we seek to make long-term investments that balance system reliability with customer affordability and environmental sustainability. Maintaining a reliable electric grid is critical to the health and welfare of our customers, and affordable electric power is vital for economic growth and to uphold our nation's competitive advantage. 
AEP is experiencing significant increases in demand in different parts of our service territory due in part to the location and performance of our transmission system. For example, we have agreements in place to interconnect customers in central Ohio that would double the demand we currently serve with additional demand beyond this currently under study. When we connect the pending demand, Columbus, Ohio will surpass New York City in electric consumption. In the race to capitalize on, technical, uh, on technological transformation, industrial customers cannot wait for us to modernize our energy policies, and more forward-looking policies will allow us to make grid investments that will deliver value to all customers in the future. Today, it can take 10 or more years to plan, permit, and build transmission projects, and sound transmission investment re requires three key elements. We call them the three Ps, planning, paying, and permitting. We identify three priorities for congressional action in these categories. First, Congress should encourage the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to reform both regional and interregional transmission planning processes to A, incorporate longer-term planning time horizons, B, include more modern and expansive planning scenarios, and C, incorporate a wider range of benefits over longer time frames to better reflect the true value of transmission investments to customers. Second, Congress should encourage FERC to ensure that the allocation of costs of transmission investments are commensurate with the distri distribution of benefits and that all appropriate benefits are carefully considered. Benefit metrics used for both regional and interregional projects need to be expanded to encompass all appropriate reliability, resilience, and economic benefits of the grid. In addition, benefits need to be measured over the useful life of assets as opposed to the farther short time, shorter time periods used today. And third, Congress should streamline the process for using federal backstop siting authority under the Federal Power Act by eliminating the requirement to utilize national interest corridors designated by the Department of Energy for transmission projects that provide significant regional or interregional reliability benefits. States play a lead role in the siting of transmission facilities and we, we believe that they should continue to do so. However, it is important for federal law to provide a workable backstop siting process for projects that, that deliver important grid reliability benefits in the rare instances where this may be needed. AEP has primarily focused our transmission siting and permitting efforts on partnering with our states to obtain necessary permits. For most of the transmission projects we've built, permitting has not been a challenge that could not be overcome, but it can be time consuming and litigious. For example, we were recently denied state authorization in Pennsylvania for an important congestion relief project that was approved by both the grid, uh, the grid planner, PJM in this instance, and the state of Maryland. The project is currently in litigation. In summary, more robust planning processes with better articulation of benefits, especially for multi-value transmission investments, can lead, or, lead to better outcomes in the siting and permitting processes. If we proactively address these challenges with appropriate and targeted reforms, it will help us achieve a coordinated and reliable energy transition that benefits customers and advances our economy. We remain deeply committed to supporting this committee's efforts in this regard and encourage you all to continue this important work. Thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Tepley. Thank you, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, and the distinguished members of this esteemed committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide my testimony before you today. My name is Chad Tepley and I work for the Williams Companies. As a senior vice president responsible for overseeing our interstate natural gas transmission pipelines and our operations in the Gulf of Mexico. Williams builds and operates interstate pipelines and the associated infrastructure throughout the country, including many of the states that are represented here today. On any given day, we handle approximately one third of all natural gas delivered in the United States. Today, I'm here to emphasize the pressing need for targeted and pragmatic permitting reforms for interstate natural gas pipelines. I would like to highlight the following three reasons that pipeline infrastructure is critically important. First, interstate pipelines infrastructure delivers our nation's abundant natural gas supplies to millions of households across the country, providing an affordable and reliable source of energy. Second, pipeline infrastructure ensures energy security and emissions reductions abroad. With reforms, we can export more liquefied natural gas to our European allies to reduce their dependence on imports from Russia and to Asian countries to reduce their dependence on higher emitting forms of energy. Third, pipeline infrastructure is necessary for our transition to a lower carbon economy here at home. 
As our power sector adds increasing amounts of intermittent energy resources, it needs dispatchable natural gas fired power to ensure grid reliability and, and affordability. In addition, increased use of both hydrogen and carbon capture and sequestration in our lower car carbon economy won't be possible without the development and construction of new interstate pipelines to transport hydrogen to facilities and carbon dioxide to storage and utilization facilities where it is needed. Currently, companies like Williams can construct an interstate, multi-state pipeline in just six to nine months. However, the permitting for that set of pipelines and infrastructure takes approximately four years and in some cases can be halted completely. The flowchart attached to my written testimony il illustrates the very extensive permitting review process and the requirements to construct an inter interstate natural gas pipeline. When Congress enacted the Natural Gas Act of 1938, it had determined that when an interstate natural pipeline is deemed to be in the public interest, the permitting and review should be done at the federal level. Congress largely preempted state permitting over such projects in part to ensure that one state could not block a pipeline project crossing its jurisdiction when that pipeline can serve and benefit a neighboring state. Several decades later, Cong Congress enacted the Clean Water Act, which is, had the sweeping goal of eliminating pollution in our nation's waterways. One component of the Clean Water Act is the Section 401 certification process which requires the developer of any project obtaining federal authorizations, such as an interstate natural gas pipeline, to obtain certification from a state that the proposed project will not violate water quality standards. For most states, this 401 certification process prompts a useful discussion between the project developer and the state about ways to site or design the project to mitigate or avoid water quality impacts. However, some states wield Section 401 as a one-state veto. For those states, there is no real discussion to be had about the design of the project or the siting. They are simply bent on rejecting it. This outcome is entirely inconsistent with congressional intent, and it has real consequences for energy affordability, reliability, and security, as well as for environmental protection. Fortunately, the SPUR Act, introduced by Ranking Member Barrasso, offers a solution. Section 3004 of the SPUR Act makes a narrow but important reforms to restore state-federal balance. First, it directs any state that has water quality concerns about a proposed interstate natural gas pipeline to bring those concerns into the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, environmental review process. Second, having, having established that NEPA is the proper forum for the environmental impact reviews, Section 3004 removes such projects from the coverage of the Clean Water Act Section 401 certification process. Importantly, Section 3004 does not remove the interstate pipelines from the purview of the Clean Water Act, nor does it impact other types of projects covered under Section 401, just interstate natural gas pipelines. Section 3004 of the SPUR Act solves the one state veto problem for interstate pipelines while still preserving critical environmental protections for all states and communities under both NEPA and the Clean Water Act. This is a common sense reform we need. The SPUR Act also proposes unlocking some of the most abundant supplies of natural gas we have in federally controlled onshore and offshore regions, making it possible for gas to contribute to our energy affordability and climate mitigation as well. Williams appreciates the opportunity of this, the efforts of this committee to apply its expertise in this area, and we stand ready to be a resource for your work Senators, thank you again for the opportunity to present here before you, and I thank you for your time. Let me thank all of you for being here today and sharing with us uh, your, your challenges and your knowledge and, and some advice maybe and how we should go forward. Let me start our questioning now. We know the litigation process can create potentially endless delays of all types. You've been speaking about that, pipelines, transmission lines, and everything in between. Uh, once a project has gone through years of federal agency reviews, Congress never intended there to be a review process in the courts that can take as long or longer than the overview of the project, whether it has merits or not. So I want to quickly ask each of you, and we'll go through this very quickly, if you will, um, uh, about the litigation reforms that, that we've proposed, okay? Uh, would it be helpful to limit the amount of times parties have to bring a case? Yes, no, whatever. Uh, yes, I think it's it necessary. Yes. 
to bring a case. Okay, so we know we can bring that. Would it be helpful to direct courts to set energy project litigation for expedited review? It's necessary. Okay. Would it be helpful to set hard timelines on how long agencies can take to fix permit issues identified by the courts? Yes. Yes. Okay. Most definitely. Now I want you to go this, this, we'll put a chart up here. Let me show you what we're dealing with. In America, usually it's nine years, normally nine years right now if you go through this process. And what we're talking about is the bills that we have been talking about and think that we should be passing would take us down to four years, cut it in half. It'd be great for transmission, be great for all types of energy because you've got to move electrons, okay? People, some things think, well, we want transmission but no pipelines. Some people say, I want pipelines but no transmission. We need everything. And this would give us a process of how we would do it in quicker and I think expedite things. So do you think we should consolidate a federal backstop siding process so there's a single environmental and national interest review at FERC? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. And any comments on that would be, be welcome if you have on that how some of your personal experiences, what you've run into, and how we could cut this down. I, I would say that currently the, the process would entire, entire, um, entail two EIS reviews, uh, two NEPA reviews uh, for conceivably the, the same project. And that is the, the understanding that the, the courts have explained out in the, the Ninth Circuit. Consolidating the process into one EIS, one NEPA review uh, just makes a lot of sense saves a lot of time, uh, and there's no redundant um, use of resources. Let me go through one more chart here I have, and I want to show you. Uh, this, this chart here shows a portion of the transmission reform proposal, which I put up, which specifies the benefits of transmission that FERC can require users to pay for. Uh, the goal was to include quantifiable electric system benefits that previously accepted by FERC and supported by courts. The biggest thing is basically is who pays. So if you're coming through the state of West Virginia, we're a net exporter of power. We don't need any more power coming in, making us pay for reliability. You just need maybe to go through our state. So here, basically, I think if you'll see this, it shows you what the bill does. Before there can be any cost allocations whatsoever, you have to show that it's improved reliability. So if you didn't have a reliable system, you have to have reduced congestion, reduced power losses, greater carrying capacity, reduced operating reserve, requirements and improve access to generation. Some states might not need any of this, but it has to have a pathway for it. Also, what we allowed in our bill is to have every state with a PSC, even if FERC requires it a national concern that we have or of national interest, uh, to go one year to work with the PSC and the local provider, such as AEP. Mm -hmm. You would make a determination. Do you want that or not? Do you want to be part of it? Or just basically say no, but you have one year to work with your PSC to make sure that you're not burdening your customers or burdening your company and your, your bottom line, if you will, to make a decision. Is that good for our business? Is it good for our customers or not? We think that was a reasonable approach, and we're trying to get that so the cost allocation does not become a cumbersome thing to where everyone says, well, it's got to be states' rights, and you can't do this and that. John doesn't need, and Senator Husso doesn't need. He's a big, powerful state with a lot of power. He's like my state. We produce a lot of power. But you might need our pathway through. So we're looking at some of that. So any comments you have on that very quickly of how that would work? I would quickly say that that list of highlighted language uh, reflects quantifiable benefits that are used by PGM and others. So that's a generally accepted list of, of benefits that we could put a price tag on with relative ease. Anybody else on that? Yes, I mean, you know, we're, we're proponents of, of including all reasonable reliability and economic benefits when it comes to the allocation of costs. I think you've captured many of them there on, uh, in your language today. Mr. Tepley, with all that, same as transmission for, for gas lines, pipelines too, right? Uh, the well. timeliness of reviews and the timeliness, timeliness and certainty. In your, biggest, your biggest obstacle right now, I mean, I know the MVP. Yes. How, how that can, it's just unbelievable. Very, very much so correlated. So what's, what's your biggest obstacle you have right now in anti-pipelines? What would you say your biggest obstacle? Our biggest obst obstacle is permitting certainty and then the subsequent judicial reviews. Gotcha. Senator Barrasso. Well, thanks so much, Mr. Mr. Tubby. Just following, you know, Williams Transports Natural Gas produced in Wyoming all across the United States. So how important is it to your company and you and to our nation to have a reliable source of production from federal lands in Wyoming? It's extremely important. Our operations in Wyoming in particular are in the Wyoming checkerboard that you're very familiar with. Um, you know, efficient development of that resource uh, drives not only from a timeliness perspective, 
the certainty around project development, but ultimately also costs in the marketplace. Certainty around efficiencies in development in the in the federal lands is, is extremely important. So it, it seems to me that a few states have abused federal statutes to block the construction of new pipelines. Uh, state of New York blocked the Constitution Pipeline and the Northeast Supply Enhancement Project. Uh, both of these pipelines would have brought much needed natural gas to New England. It seems every year we hear about how expensive natural gas is in New England. We have senators from, on this committee from those areas. New York blocked these pipelines even though FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, found that both projects were actually in the national interest. Can you expand on how New York abused its authorities under the Clean Water Act to halt these important projects that would be so helpful in bringing affordable energy to so much of our country? Thank you, Senator. Uh, the experiences we had in our Constitution pipeline and our Nessie pipeline in particular uh, were varied uh, with respect to the Clean Water Act permitting processes. Uh, they ranged, the issues ranged from administrative uh, uh, requirements for, for completeness uh, of applications to short-term uh, construction type impacts that would not have carried through to the broader project's lifetime. Uh, the impacts there, obviously, from a, a constituency perspective, uh, disallowing those projects uh, requires that the New England states in, in, that would have been served by these pipelines ultimately continue to boil or to, to burn heating oil uh, that's not only more expensive, but also has a higher polluting uh, characteristics than other sources of energy. So worse for the environment because they block these things and higher costs for consumers. It seems like from That's correct. a lose-lose. So, so what impact did this decision have specifically on, say, natural gas prices and stability of the grid then in New England? I think from a stability perspective, um, the, the issues that you see in New England, um, obviously a lot of that energy served from LNG uh, because of the lack of infrastructure, pipeline infrastructure in that area, uh, causing significant concerns with respect to both reliability and cost on an annual basis as we, part in particular, heading into the heating seasons for that area. I mean, sometimes you hear natural gas prices in New England at $18 versus Pennsylvania at $3, and they're not that far apart. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith, the committee has recently heard testimony about the increasing risks to electric reliability in the United States. The, from that table, we've heard from, from FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and, and, and uh, then also the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. Uh, they agree that the country is had potentially running into a reliability cr uh, crisis. They also agree that the principal reason for the problem is the premature retirement of coal, natural gas, and nuclear power plants before there is replacement energies available. Do you agree that the primary problem right now is the premature retirements and not lack of transmission? Yes, you know, I, I, I think as if you look at the NERC data, um, that's that's what it, it it will clearly tell you. Uh, transmission does play an important part in 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 this, and we'd like to see more transmission developed. Uh, we think that can be you know very constructive in so far as uh, uh, you know solving some of these uh, future potential reliability issues going forward. Uh, so, FERC has specific authority to cite, Mr. Smith, the. Uh, the interstate electric transmission lines within the National Interest Corridor. Uh, corridors are established by the Department of Energy. Do you believe Congress can improve the Department of Energy's process for establishing a National Interest Corridor? Yes, yes we do. Uh, in particular for projects that provide significant reliability benefits, you know, we think that process can be streamlined uh, to one uh, set of processes you know, without reducing the uh, quality of the environmental reviews. So should, should Congress ensure that states and regions and other experts have more of a say in establishing the corridors? Uh, yes. Okay. So would improving opportunities for state input and streamlining the process remove some of these barriers that we talked about? For we, we believe so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. And now we're going to have uh, Senator Rona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> this hearing is happening when millions of people in this country as well as around the world, are suffering through record-breaking heat following up on the hottest June ever recorded. And literally, when you see people being injured just by stepping on sidewalks, et cetera, where we, you see the enormity of the concerns. So we are on a path towards even more intense heat, wildfires, and extreme weather unless we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by shifting to solar power and other lower cost zero carbon sources. 
Um, Democrats in Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act to help speed the trans transition to clean energy. And we need to build new clean sources of energy in a fair manner and at a pace that reflects the severity of the global warming we are facing. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this panel or this hearing. For Mr. Tepley, your testimony states your company, quote, is a strong believer in NEPA and the environmental impact statement process. We use the EIS process to engage with affected communities and understand their needs. And in our experience, the EIS process helps us identify modifications we can make to pipeline projects that will avoid or mitigate adverse impacts on the environment. My question to you, do you think Congress should consider federal grants to state, tribal, and local agencies and to community-based organizations to increase their capacity for completing state, tribal, and local environmental reviews? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, as Williams, we are very much so focused on stakeholder engagement uh, throughout our project development processes, including engaging our environmental justice community, our tribes, uh, in areas that we operate in and have infrastructure that affects those folks. Um, we, we spend a lot of time through the early project development, engaging, identifying potential workarounds, including reciting uh, where important or where possible and practical. Uh, so we do think that there, the, the engagement at the stakeholder, le old stakeholder level is extremely important, and we think that we are doing a good job of... Well, actually, the, the question was whether the, you, th you think that uh, these uh, stakeholders should have a, should increase their capacity to engage in the process because these are complicated issues. And in fact, Senator Copper proposed uh, such a grant program to enable these stakeholders to better uh, engage in the process. I think that, that that's probably a good idea. Um, and Yes, I think, it, yeah. as an example, we've engaged with the FERC Office of Public Participation, uh, which is very similar to what you're describing. Uh, very early on as that, pro as that department mm -hmm. was, was stood up uh, with a, a keen interest in having a seat at the table with them as that process plays through FERC. And providing some funding for them could even uh, maybe shorten the entire process of a review. For Mr. Smythe, in Hawaii, we have smaller capacity transmission lines compared to your company's lines. How much benefit uh, to the capacity and reliability of the grid can come from upgrading the lines in existing transmission pathways? Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you for your question. I, I, I think that you know you can see benefits when you upsize uh, transmission lines, um, but you want to right size transmission lines as well. Um, so it, it really depends upon the use case. But generally speaking, uh, as as more demand uh, as demand increases and supply changes, uh, upsizing the capacity of transmission lines can be a, can drive good outcomes for customers. And then to change the transmission lines, we're talking about a, a pretty expensive proposition. So uh, do electric companies, uh, utility companies, have the right incentives to invest in upgrading existing lines compared to building new lines? Yes, uh, we, we, we believe they do. You think that they currently have those kinds of incentives? Yes, yes, I do, do believe the incentives are there. I do believe that uh, we need to uh, modify the planning processes. Uh, we need to modify cost allocation. We need to do, do things that, that make it easier to move through the processes. So uh, speaking of cost allocations, um, can you elaborate on how you think regulators should measure and determine the public benefit of new transmission lines and how that uh, uh, the, the going to new transmission lines expenditure should be allocated to the ratepayers as opposed to the utilities? Yes, you know, uh, we, we believe that uh, beneficiaries and payers should be aligned. We think that, that benefits should be calculated in a broad manner that include all reasonable reliability uh, and economic benefits, uh, and the cost should be distributed uh, accordingly. That may be easier said than done because Hawaii, for example, I, I think it still pays the highest rates in the country for electricity. So anytime there's a potential for increasing those costs, uh, there are going to be concerns raised. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to pass for now. Thank okay. you. Okay. Senator Highsmith. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for being willing to be here and serve in this capacity. It is truly appreciated, and I know it's not always easy. But uh, currently, the permitting process that we're also concerned about is centered around the cumbersome bureaucratic process that delays and hinders so many energy products, as we're well aware, especially in Mississippi and my Gulf state. And permitting procedure discourages and energy and in domestic energy you just drink for life yes that to the the natural gas build to support those projects uh, our goal certainty of outcome meaning that uh, the requirements of, of our permitting and re review processes are thorough and we're willing to work in that environment but the certainty of timing is getting these projects done and maintaining your investors interest in such projects and do you agree that a permitting process would provide more certainty for utilities for benefit customers and economic development as well as increase safety and liability of the natural gas industry. Absolutely, and the the re streamlined permitting process with respect to customer impacts drives uh, projects that are made and ultimately canceled their development activity. Customers can bear that cost, uh, whether that ability also uh, and 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 potential. And natural gas and LNGs have critical energy in the United domestically on a large scale. Mr. Tapley, how abundant is supply of natural gas? We definitely, thank you for the question. We don't have a supply concern gas in the United States. We, what we have is an infrastructure, getting infrastructure built to tap into the abundant sources across our country to serve not only domestic load affordably and reasonably and effectively, so the potential to serve uh, the international loads, like I had mentioned earlier. A good position. Yes, a very good position. In light of the administration's goals to decrease greenhouse gas emissions, do you consider the administration a willing partner for domestic natural gas? Question. I think right now we have challenges uh, to, to production and, and, and infrastructure development across the country. Um, whether I would deem that a willing partner, that would be hard to say right now, uh, but I would say with the permitting reforms that we're talking about, um, ultimately those types of steps taken by this body and others uh, can, can, can continue to move our our country forward as well as the globe forward with respect to emission reductions that, that it can be supported by natural gas infrastructure. And to transmit, uh, I want to transition to the importance of investments of the for the natural gas industry in these pipelines. What effects have the continuous delays due to the current permitting process had on the investment opportunity? Uh, ultimately, uh, since 2016, if you look at some of the major projects across uh, the country, including the two that I used as examples in my testimony, uh, resulted in cancellations. Uh, so ultimately, those are projects that were intended to provide benefits to certain constituencies and customer groups uh, that were not delivered. Uh, so that increases the risk around reliability of service, particularly in heating seasons. Uh, it, it also impacts uh, cost effectiveness of growth in those areas. So there's a number of different types of impacts that, that play through 
uh, delays and cancellations of major infrastructure projects. Thank you very much, and my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to get my quite question. I always want to have the first question first. Um, thank you all for your work and for being here today. Um, let me start with Mr. Stanek. Um, I want to commend you for uh, leading a diverse task force of 10 state utility regulators from across the country in public dialogues with the FERC commissioners on electric transmission over the last couple of years. Um, this concept of minimum transfer requirements, which would require regions to be able to move some share of their peak load with their neighbors, proved a popular idea among state regulators from Kansas to Arkansas to your own Maryland. Um, can you speak to how minimum transfer requirements could help address current reliability shortfalls on the grid while maintaining autonomy for states to chart their, their own energy futures? Thank you, Senator, and thank you for recognizing the, the good work of the 15 members of the Federal State Task Force. We've advanced the dialogue for, for sure. I, I have been on record as stating that having some minimum transfer capacity between regions is important. And it's important not only for reliability and resilience, but it's important for uh, assisting neighbors during times of need. We've seen the effects of Winter Storm Uri. We saw the effects more recently of Winter Storm Elliott. When PGM um, desperately relied on the assistance of one of our neighbors, New York ISO, to uh, export power to. The fact is there is no minimum standard currently, and by including a minimum standard, uh, we will ensure that across the country, uh, regions will be able to either import or export power to, the, to their neighbors. Uh, with respect to the, the, the role of, of the states, uh, it's important that states have a say in the designation and uh, selection of these transmission lines. But at, at the end of the day, the states also have exclusive jurisdiction over the siting of generation and determining what resources they would like to uh, connect to those transmission lines. So it's a, I think it's an important issue. I know that FERC is looking at it now, uh, but I'm glad that this body is as well. Right. The, the nice thing is I think this, we talk a lot about making sure that our, our, this transition to a new energy system is as inexpensive um, and as reliable as our existing one. Obviously, we want it to be cleaner. Um, but I think that reliability and the ability to deal with extreme weather events and other uh, intrusions into, into normal life, uh, this, the, this notion of having some minimum level of transfer, transferability is important. Uh, do you have a range of prices that, or a range of percentages of like what percentage would make sense in something like that? It would always be hard to d determine a, a number specific. Um, and you want to ensure that a number is not so high where you're going to be including additional costs and expenses. I, I view it very much as an insurance policy. You hope you don't need the, the transfer capacity from your neighbor, uh, but in a desperate time or dark hour, uh, you, you, you need that. I would be hard pressed, I'm not a system engineer, to determine what a specific number is, um, but I, I do believe there is wisdom in picking a number as opposed to having a multi-year process at FERC to determine what that number should be. Gotcha. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Smith, um, AEP is the largest transmission-owning own, utility nationwide, so you know firsthand the challenges of, of getting large projects completed. Um, matter of fact, in the last decade, all of North America's builders nearing completing just seven gigawatts of large-scale interregional lines, seven gigawatts. In South America, over the same time period, that it's not seven, that number is 22 gigawatts. In Europe, it's 44 gigawatts. Uh, China recently built a single interregional transmission line that carries 12 gigawatts in one line, uh, almost twice the figure for the entire North American uh, continent. Um, do you think we, we would benefit from a minimum transfer requirement to jolt our, our system out of its current slumber, its lethargy? Um, I mean, what's your sense on that? 
Yes, uh, thanks for your question. You know, and, and I agree with what Jason said. I mean, when when regions get in trouble, they bar they 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 can borrow from each other, and and that can provide a great deal of help when it comes to system reliability. Uh, when it comes to a minimum bulk power, you know, transfer capability thresholds, uh, that is something that I I think can be very useful uh, and supportive insofar as 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 um, uh, addressing reliability between regions. Uh, we do believe, though, that uh, customization of a threshold is important just to really account for and make sure that we're, we are um, aligning uh, benefits and, and, and costs sure. appropriately. Got it. Well, I'm out of time. I, I, maybe I'll come back. And th this notion of I, I always want to ask, ask, what is the cost of continuing to not build yes. in a regional projects? What's that, what's that going to cost us down the road? But we'll worry about that later. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. And now we're going to go to Senator Cassidy. Thank you. Mr. Stanick, I uh, don't expect you to comment on pending litigation, but I understand that the state of Pennsylvania is blocking a transmission line that would go from Maryland to uh, through Pennsylvania, despite being approved by everybody else. Um, so let's not, and I only use that to set up that it's real life, but I'm going to ask you about the theoretical. Um, the federal state management boards of which you speak and praise and say we need more of, what additional teeth do they need in order to avoid a theoretical situation where somebody may, where Pennsylvania may approve a project and want to ship, ship it into Maryland and Maryland says no? Well, the, the board that I spoke of does not have any legal authority right now. It's a collaboration between the federal and, and state authorities. Uh, but the, the example that you speak to uh, is a very important uh, transource transmission line where the Maryland Public Service Commission found a genuine bona fide need to bring uh, power into Maryland and Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, um, because of reliability violations that PGM has determined. Uh, unfortunately, my colleagues north of the, the border in Harrisburg decided that the, the line was not needed. Um, th that is, is an example of an interstate line where states have come out on two totally different sides of whether or not the, the line is, is needed. And that's a situation where uh, the federal government may need to step in. So is that the solution? Because earlier my chair, uh, Senator Manchin, spoke of judicial review, kind of a, a shot clock, you got to finish, you can't go on forever. Uh, are you favoring a solution like that that would have, okay, circumscribe, we're going to complete the decision-making process by this time? Would, would you be in favor of that? I, I think a shot clock is important, legal due process uh, for the, the, the state who is out of favor uh, is, is important to have their review uh, reviewed by the, the court. But that should not go on in, in um, ad finitum for potentially years at a time. So I think a statute of limitations is necessary. Sounds good. Mr. Smith, uh, just for the record, I know AEP is attempting to lower their carbon footprint. Uh, to what, how much, um, however you want to, whatever unit you wish to express, has AEP lowered their carbon footprint by converting coal-fired plants to natural gas? Uh, yes, you know we, we do have uh, uh, carbon reduction goals, uh, as as you mentioned, uh, and you know it, what is uh, first and form of foremost importance to us is balancing system reliability. Uh, got to hurry because I got limited time. Sure, sure. So, yes. so, so how much have y'all lowered your CO two emission profile relative because of conversion from one type of fuel to the other? Uh, I don't have a specific number uh, with me today, but I'm happy to circle back with you on that. Now, on your testimony, you speak about having sensitivities. The more sensitivities you have, the more robust your analysis. But on the other hand, I could also see where you ended up sticking ratepayers, my, my, my constituents, with a lot of cost for theoretical things which may occur. It may be that Louisiana uh, needs uh, electricity, although almost always we don't. But in that nth degree possibility that we do, we're going to charge you for a, for a potential of an interregional uh, transmission line, which principally is being built to benefit other people. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, your question makes sense. You know, we're you know again proponents of you know ensuring that reasonable benefits are included, known and measurable, more known and measurable benefits are included in those benefit calculations. Now, you're also, as I understand, converting to a lot of renewables. In your testimony, you speak of renewable. Uh, energy and Mr. Stanick's testimony, he references one of his references, speaks to the fact that it can cost more to have renewable energy, uh, and that the, 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 and you imply that it uh, contributes, and we've seen other examples where it's contributed to so-called energy poverty. 
people are paying so much for the utility bill, they don't have money for other essentials uh, because of the increased cost of the renewables. How are you all balancing that in your portfolio? Is this all being driven by mandates? Is it, you know, I'm representing people who, again, they don't have enough money to pay any bill. Inflation has been killing them. And inflation in the utility bill, as your, as your testimony, Mr. Stanick, speaks to, uh, is concerning. So how do we balance this, um, um, uh, all these different factors so that the customer still can afford her bills? Yes, uh, you know, we go through an integrated resource planning process to determine what generation is most economic for our customers. And so we, it is a least reasonable cost generation portfolio that emerges from that process, uh, including in, in, in Louisiana, which we're going through that uh, process now. But I assume that at some point you accept the higher cost because of legal mandates. Uh, no, I, I believe that we we move forward with a least reasonable cost portfolio, notwithstanding you know any any mandates. Of, of course, if there is a state that has a renewable portfolio standard that we have to meet, you know, of course we comply with the law. Sounds good. And then just in my, my remaining time, uh, Mr. Tepley, you speak of the cost of initiating a project which is never completed because of litigation and other things which would either thwart or prolong, even if it's eventually done, uh, and how that cost is passed on to the ratepayer. I presume that is a real cost. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, that is a real cost. And one in the margin, in the aggregate, ends up making my patient just, my patient, I'm sorry, I'm a doc, so it comes to mind. Um, methane means something different to a gastroenterologist, but nonetheless. <laughs> uh, the uh, point being is that that marginal cost actually is more likely to contribute to the individual's propensity to go into energy poverty than if that cost actually was not there. I mean, it just kind of begs itself. Yeah, in general terms, yes. Yeah, I yield. Thank you. Senator Cortez Mastil. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, the ranking member. Thank you. So, uh, clearly, such an important conversation. I thank you to the panelists for being here. Uh, I am glad we are really continuing um, to work on and addressing permitting reform discussion. You know, I just had a subcommittee hearing here that I chaired, and I talked about an, a perfect example of this is uh, we have an a industrial park in southern Nevada. We're trying to build out. We have companies coming there. Uh, unfortunately, in Nevada, over 80% of the land is owned by the federal government. So for each company that wants to bring infrastructure to that site, they have to get a permit from the Department of Interior, which takes at least three years. That's each company, including a utility, to lay, to lay the same right-of-way, the same pipe, the same fiber. They each have to get it. I mean, it, we, we've gotten really out of control here when it comes to permitting. We need to streamline it. We need to work together for the very reasons that we're talking about. And in Nevada, we need to work together so that we can continue these clean energy projects. Nevada is the number one solar uh, economy in the country. We have the potential here to really lean into our clean energy and renewables, and we can't really slow it down by not having uh, really this efficient uh, permitting that is necessary and faster permitting. So I, I'm, I'm all about having this conversation, and I thank you all for being here. Mr. Stanek, let me ask you this. In your written testimony, you touched on your experiences with the Joint Federal State Task Force uh, on Electric Transmission. Um, and stakeholders in my state of Nevada have spoken to the benefits uh, of this collaboration and coordination, uh, and it has a really produced efficiencies that we have all been talking about. My question to you is, as the permitting reform conversation continues, can you elaborate on, on further opportunities um, to ensure that states maintain a, a strong position in future transmission siting decisions? Thank you, Senator, for that question. Uh, the, the state task force has made a lot of progress, and, and one of the charter members supporting it was uh, um, your chairman in Nevada of the PUC there. Uh, this has been an issue where the states have historically had exclusive rights to, to site energy infrastructure projects, particularly electric transmission in their, their states. There is some concern that there's a potential power grab or preemption of, of state authority. So it's a needle that state regulators are very sensitive to thread and, and be, be mindful of. Um, I'm a former regulator now by about four weeks, uh, but, but it's an issue that I know they are thoughtful of. Um, they're working with their counterparts at the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, to discuss these issues uh, every couple of months. They just had a meeting last week on transmission technologies. Um, so it's an active, active engagement. We all want the same goal, more streamlined, efficient permitting processes of energy infrastructure because 
as I stated at the outset, we can't wait anymore. This yellow flashing light is go soon going to be a red flashing light. Right. And, and while I have you, can you talk a little bit about, you, you, you elaborate on uh, your scenario-based regional planning framework. What is that? What, what do you mean by that? For, for too long, the, the transmission and grid operators have been planning just in time for reliability needs to make sure that the lights stay on, which is very important. But planning for a longer term horizon, let's say 20 years, and looking at various options and scenarios that could occur uh, based on a 100% clean energy environment, a 50% clean energy environment, is not what the RTOs, ISOs, and transmission authorities have generally done. Um, we've discovered now that that is very important. Uh, FERC's current rulemaking is examining that. But looking at different scenarios and trying to pick the one that we most expect to occur on the horizon will allow us to be more efficient with the dollars spent where the projects are actually built. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Smith, you outlined some near-term uh, steps that industry and policymakers should consider um, taking to accelerate the pace of new generation transmission. Uh, you talked about the three Ps. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that and, and why that is important? Yes, uh, you know, and, and, and we think it all starts with permitting, and uh, I agree with what uh, uh, Jason just said with respect to uh, modernizing uh, uh, and expanding planning scenarios. We think that's important because of the changes in supply, uh, the changes in demand that are occurring. Weather is changing. We need to include more expansive weather scenarios uh, in this planning process. And, you know, in the end, if we have a longer planning process, it will drive more efficient outcomes. Shorter planning processes tend and can result in more people piecemeal, a uh, piecemeal grid, um, which, you know, if we're thinking about long-term investments and thinking about, you know, customer affordability in the long term, it's important to lengthen that, that, that planning timeline. Thank you. And then very quickly, Mr. Tefley, because you know the West very well, I'm Southern Nevada, 114 degrees. What would you, what would you, should we be thinking about in this extreme weather that we are seeing in, in, in the Western states? How can we enhance that transmission planning or better thinking about the weather as it impacts uh, what we need for our transmission needs? Um, unfortunately, Williams is not in the business of building electric transmission, so I'm not sure that I can give you a good answer for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That we could help you with. <laughs> Senator, uh, we have now Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you and the ranking member for holding this hearing. I want to follow on my colleague from Nevada because I too believe that we need to, as Western states, as we look at new supply coming from many different directions, whether it's uh, renewables like wind and solar or small modular reactors or just what might be coming with geothermal or other types of energy we need to plan. What do you think the best way for us to plan across the various RTOs? What would you suggest that we undertake here as a discussion point? Uh, I do want to follow up on just smart grid technology in general because I also think um, as a part of the country that has very cheap electricity and see it continuing to build over and over again, there are efficiencies in the system that I think the continued implementation of both transmission capacity, like we just saw with BPA's decision to uh, build, and the technological implementations of things like middle mile, where utilities and telcos are working together, are, are good things. But what, what do we need to do to plan across RTOs? What, what is it that you think needs to happen? Um, yeah, yes, I can, I can take a crack at that first. Um, you know, I, I think integrating the planning processes a bit more uh, is, is going to be really valuable and helpful. You know, today there's a commitment to coordinate, uh, but the planning processes and regions are, are by and large very separate. Uh, and so I think if you truly integrate those processes uh, in each regions to account for interregional planning, uh, that that will go a long way insofar as, you know, moving needed interregional uh, transmission along. And who do you think takes the lead on that? Uh, I think the RTO, ISOs, uh, or the grid planning authorities uh, should do that. You, I'm sorry, you're saying I-N-T-E-R or 
I N T R A. Yeah, inter regional. Yes. Okay. Um, so the, the 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 planning authorities, whether it's you know the if if you're in an area where there's an RTO or a balancing authority. But if you're if we're looking at this now as this really big and important opportunity for the United States of America to lead on grid technology, I just think of it almost as an operating system coming from a software state too that you le- realize the operating system can deliver you efficiencies. The grid is at this capacity where it can move power around, and we want it to. Recently, with these big heat waves, you could move electricity around, but you need to have that kind of grid built, which means it needs to be built across the entire system. So where do you think that discussion lies? Do you think yeah. we need somebody to, to lead that at the federal level? Yes, yeah, so we, we agree, and, and I think that would be led at, at FERC. Okay. Mr. Stanek. Senator, you, you raise a good point because in this country we don't have a national transmission planner. DOE doesn't plan transmission. FERC doesn't plan transmission. Uh, they do have some oversight authority. So we, we leave it to the grid operators to work together between between regions, inter-regional uh, communications. And they, they've done that. But at the, the same time, uh, they're running their own grids on a daily basis and they have a lot to do. Order 1000, which was FERC's attempt to uh, promote competition between regions, uh, has not worked. It's, it's effectively been a failure over the past 12 years. Uh, there were some interregional requirements in that order, uh, but they have not come to fruition. Uh, so there is some reform that's necessary there. I believe the current FERC commission is looking at that right now, and hopefully they'll promulgate some new rules. But it is uh, of critical importance that the regions work more closely together to transfer resources, to transfer technologies, um, to ensure reliability as well. Well, let me let me be clear. I'm not a huge fan of RTOs in the context of like, yes, we're going to sell more expensive power onto the grid and whoever, you know, is the highest bidder gets to sell their power. I'm not for that because uh, what we want to do is drive down electricity costs. That's what we really want to do. And again, as a state that's benefited from a great history there, but it seems to me your notion of a national uh, transmission planner, if that's you know that that isn't just at FERC, uh, or, or maybe maybe it is at FERC. But we we need to have both the scope of what that gets us as we think about transmission capacity and and also the oversight at at FERC. So it seems to me that we're still missing somebody in addition there, whether you think that that's at a White House executive level or over at DOE. But I don't know if you have a comment on that. Uh, there is one proposal out there um, coming from FERC determining whether or not we need something called an ITC, an independent transmission coordinator. Uh, that That is currently uh, under discussion. There's not a lot of uh, details at this point, uh, but th- there are supporters of the, the concept saying, well, we do need one independent body aside from FERC to, to look at transmission to ensure that the regions are actually working together um, to, to build out transmission in a thoughtful efficient. Well, I, I will just take a nod on this. I would assume everybody agrees that this is a huge opportunity and we need to have more planning and, and, and more coordination. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Oh, Senator Murkowski. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the panel here um, and, and just the opportunity for yet another, another round, um, second opportunity to be talking about permitting and permitting reform. We've made a little bit of headway, but we all know that there is so much more room and uh, uh, we need to get going yesterday. Mr. Stanek, I appreciate your uh, mentioning of cooperative federalism in your written testimony, this idea that the state and federal agencies have have overlapping responsibilities and functions and powers. Um, uh, one of the problems that we face in a state like Alaska, where we're not part of the, the lower 48 grid, as you all know, um, we are our own islanded world up there, but oftentimes we see the permitting process um, that contains Alaska-specific uh, requirements for regulatory agencies. This is this comes under ANILCA, the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, um, and and they govern how the the TUS is the trans, uh, transportation utility ser- system, um, whether it's broadband powers, um, how they all proceed through the permitting process. So you've got ANILCA that sets aside lots of 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 areas, um, huge sections of land for conservation, for parks and wildlife and the like. But it mandates these unique protections 
um, for access that all agencies are required to use. And, you know, it's not a bad idea. You're trying to balance the conservation here on the one hand um, with the needs of those in these small um, and very remote villages that have um, significantly underdeveloped infrastructure. So given your focus on this, how, how do you propose permitting reform address some of these state-specific issues where you have um, federal agencies that are just, maybe they're dragging their feet, maybe it's non-compliance, um, but what effectively happens is the projects are stopped or they are made so prohibitively, prohibitively cost expensive that you just can't move forward. How do we reconcile this? Because it's a big, big issue in my state. Well, we've seen that every state is, is unique. Obviously, yours is, is very different than the, those in the lower 48. Um, states obviously want to have the first, first and last opportunity to review any in infrastructure project. They know uh, their local communities best. They know their, their, their needs best. Um, at the, the same time, if the process is open-ended and there's no time limitation, um, state commissions or state siting authorities could either run out the clock or indefinitely delay the siting of right. a project, whether it be for local interest or, or national interest. Uh, we've never seen state uh, backstop authority used in the past 18 years. And, and hopefully, going forward, if legislation is passed to provide some type of federal backstop, uh, states will understand there will be motivation for the states to efficiently process the permit, um, whether they approve or deny. Uh, but at the same time, it will give the states the, the respect of their jurisdiction to determine the needs for their, their um, citizens. It's something that I, I think we talk about and, and we can make it flow on paper. It's just harder in practical application. Um, I don't know whether this question has already been asked and answered, but you all are our professionals in your areas have given a great deal of thought to um, to how you could design a better permitting process um, throughout this country that would allow for the efficiencies and the, and the protections that everyone is, is, is looking for. In your perfect plan, what's your number one, what is the number one thing that we could do to put into place in, in terms of regulatory policy that could make um, a difference when it comes to enhanced permitting for this country. And since I just picked on you, Mr. Stranick, let's start with you, Mr. Tepley, and just go down. Thank, thank you for the question. Uh, I think our number one priority, we've touched on it today, really is to, to, find, to refine that balance between state and federal uh, permitting obligations as it relates to natural gas infrastructure in particular. Um, the Clean Water Act provisions that we've talked about in the SPUR Act get us partway there. Uh, that becomes a very clear line of demarcation as to who is ultimately responsible for not only the timelines, but the reviews and ultimately um, the success of that permitting process. So I think that's number one okay. for, for Williams. Would agree, Mr. Smythe? Yes, uh, number one for us is, is getting uh, the planning process right, getting the cost allocation right, and then we believe that permitting and siting become a lot easier when you get those first two steps right in the first place. Yeah, when people aren't Arguing over the cost allocation that does allow for easier conversation, Mr. Stanick? Uh, limiting the, the timeline for environmental reviews without degrading them, I think will be very important to get these EIS and environmental assessments issued by FERC and other uh, agencies done quickly. Okay, see Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Uh, Vice Chairman here, it's really easy. We got the three ideas, we just build the bill and we're done. Thank you. I agree, Senator King. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I think it's important to, to begin uh, to think about this issue from the, from the point of view of environmental protection. And for years, the orientation of the environmental community is to say no. And in order to electrify the United States and develop the, uh, a true green energy future, we're going to have to start saying yes. And I would submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, the uh, article by Bill McKibben uh, in a recent edition of Mother Jones where he, he, the title of the article is yes in, in our backyards, because he chronicles his journey from a, a solid environmental, he's one of the most outstanding environmentalists in the country, to the realization that in order to achieve the future we want environmentally, we're going to have to build things, including a lot of new transmission. Uh, so I think that's, a, that's a, an important context to this, to this hearing. This isn't just about getting rid of environmental regulations because we don't like them. This is 
trying to streamline a process, not the, not the underlying policy, but the process in order to achieve the kind of future that we, we all want. The second suggestion I have is we ought to have James Madison at this hearing because we're really talking about some very deep issues of federalism and the relationships between the federal and the state. Interestingly, as I've been listening, in both pipelines and transmission, in pipelines, we're talking about federal backstop authority on the state's ability to block a project on, under Section 401. That's, that's the problem you just identified. On the transmission side, uh, we're talking about uh, state's ability to permit transmission, but there needs to be a federal backstop in order to be sure, you, your term, I love, Mr. Stenick, motivation for the states to efficiently process. Mr. Stenick, do you, do you agree that we've got to find, there has to be some federal backstop, I believe, in both cases, uh, but we can't do it in just one and not the other? There, there has to be a middle ground uh, going back to cooperative federal, federalism where the That's the a state, nice term. Madison would have liked that term, I think. <laughs> I think he would approve. Um, and we're moving in that direction. We've had backstop siting authority since EPAC 2005. It hasn't been used for a number of reasons. Uh, changes have been up made in the uh, recent uh, IIJA legislation. Uh, but mo motivation is, is important. Otherwise, um, state agencies, like any other agency, has resource limitations. And these are very expensive, comprehensive reviews that need to be undertaken. Some agencies, like my former agency, only 160 employees, it could take six months, 12 months, 18 months or longer to, to conduct a review. Uh, however, if there is a f federal law uh, that would effectively uh, allow this. A year. A year. Uh, it would depend on the project. If it's a simple solar project, we could get that done in uh, 16 months. If it's offshore wind turbines or an interstate transmission line, it could take, it could take longer than a year. But at the but, same time, does the term cooperative federalism to you mean there would be a backstop at some point, whether we don't, whether it's a year, 18 months, two years, but there has to be some incentive to the state to do its duty on these projects? As I stated a moment ago, the motivation uh, needs to be there. So, yes, I think a deadline needs to be in place at some point. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but one of the, one of the delays now in developing a, the, the grid is not, uh, not permitting reform necessarily, but interconnection issues. Uh, I've talked to developers that are in line forever, not with the, with the PUC or the FERC, but with the ISO. Uh, is that an issue that you see that's something, I don't know whether we need to address it, but that is a bottleneck, is it not? Uh, y yes, Senator, it is a major bottleneck um, that you've identified there. So, so in some regions, there are you know, hundreds of thousands of megawatts queued up uh, seeking to interconnect. And, and, and we need to move through those processes faster. Uh, in addition to that, you know, we would like to see a prioritization of projects in that queue for load responsible entities, such as ourselves, who have an obligation to serve end use customers. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tenick, I'm, I'm running out of time, but one of the things that bothers me is the incentive toward uh, building as opposed to nine wires alternatives. Uh, or reconducting that is a wires alternative, but you, you know what I mean. Storage, uh, all the all the ways that we can uh, minimize the capital cost. Uh, it bothers me that the the incentive to a utility is to is to maximize the capital cost because they make a rate of return on the invested capital. They don't make a rate of return on a uh, demand side management program. Talk to me about that. Obviously, we have a lot of other technologies now, all these grid-enhancing technologies that could often come in as... Here, here's one right here. This is a new conductor that will double the, the, the volume of power that will be carried. It's more expensive, but it would cut line losses, double the amount. You don't have to build new towers. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. And state regulators have been looking at that carbon core fiber technology as, as well. You could do it as a fraction of a cost of building a green line transmission. Right. So you take down the old lines, you put up the, the new line. Uh, at the end of the day, state regulators want to be cost effective because I could tell you that the only thing customers hate more than their utility bill is not having reliable electricity. Of course. Um, but is there, uh, should we be talking about a federal policy that said before you start talking about a major capital investment, you have to show us that you've exhausted your non-wires alternatives? That has been in the discussion. I know FERC is currently- Some states have that policy. States do have that policy. We, we do review the transmission projects, um, and we want to make sure they're costly, uh, cost efficient. 
as well as delivering the reliability needs. So there is some oversight at the state level as to the need, do we need this project? And if so, what type of a project, what type of infrastructure? Um, obviously the most intrusive is building a new greenfield transmission line. Got it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. The uh, first panel, uh, this uh, discussion will, will, uh, will come to an end now, and I wanna thank you all, it's been very helpful. We've gotta do something, we all agree on that, and we're all trying to do something in a bipartisan way, working together with the concerns we have, but also the security of our nation's energy. So with that, I wanna thank you all. This will be, first panel will be adjourned, and second panel, they'll come forward and we'll get started. Okay. I know, I got you on that, I got you. He got him last right now, I was gonna do the first two, and then I'm gonna turn over to you to introduce him. If you wanna do that now, we'll go get him. They changed positions then. She probably works for you. I don't care where. <laughs> okay, here you guys, number two. Man, they changed that all. Second panel will come to order, and we're going to get started again here. And I want to thank you all for being here and, uh, and uh, sharing with us your expertise. And we're going to start now with our opening statements. And what we'll have is we'll have uh, uh, Mr. Milato. Is it Milato or Milito? Milito. Milito. Mr. Milito. He's president of the National Oceans Industry Association. Then we're going to have Mr. Pete Obermuller, uh, who is president of the Petroleum Association of Wyoming. And then we'll have Ms. Kelly Speaks Bachman, uh, Executive Vice President of Public Affairs in Venergy. In Venergy. In Venergy. Uh, okay, so first we'll start with Mr. Melito. Thank you, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Eric Melito, and I am the President of the National Ocean Industries Association, or NOIA. At NOIA, we represent all segments of the offshore energy industry. This includes oil and gas, wind, offshore minerals, and offshore carbon sequestration. Our membership includes energy developers, but also the entire supply chain of companies that make up the offshore energy system. This includes fabricators, vessel service companies, marine construction companies, offshore subsea engineering companies, and many others. The offshore energy sector is a proven leader in solving energy challenges and delivering diverse sources of energy to the global economy. The offshore industry has unparalleled expertise and experience deploying and scaling technologies at levels necessary to produce foundational energy sources and to achieve decarbonization objectives. As we move forward and work together to build the energy system of tomorrow, we should focus on securing our oil and gas from low emission basins like the Gulf of Mexico, which has among the lowest carbon intensity barrels of the producing regions of the world, promoting a pathway for US leadership in offshore wind, and removing roadblocks to investment in and the build out of carbon capture and storage projects. One of the most <laughs> promising opportunities for CO2 storage in the US can be found in federal waters, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico. However, government policy out of Washington plays a central role in the ability of our industry to make the investments and build the projects to sustain the American economy. We appreciate the continued efforts of the chairman, ranking member, and members of the committee to work together and develop solutions to streamline the pathway for investment in U.S. energy and infrastructure projects. Whether it is oil and gas, wind, or carbon storage, companies need certainty and predictability in leasing, permitting, and regulation in order to commit the funding and resources to projects that often cost billions of dollars to construct. Congress has a central role in helping to overcome the obstacles that often arise in a regulatory process and oftentimes in litigation for energy projects. For the foreseeable future, our economy will depend upon affordable and reliable supplies of oil and gas. The U.S. Gulf of Mexico oil and gas sector supports more than 350,000 good-paying jobs located throughout the country, and it produces among the lowest carbon intensity barrels in the world. For our energy security and national security, the Gulf of Mexico should be a no-brainer as a preferred choice for securing our oil and gas supplies. Unfortunately, in June 2021, the administration implemented a pause in offshore oil and gas leasing that was contrary to law and served to block investment in U.S. energy projects. To compound things, 
The administration allowed the leasing program for offshore oil and gas to expire at the end of June 2022, putting in place the first ever gap in offshore leasing programs, further jeopardizing long-term prospects for U.S. energy production. More recently, just five days ago, on Friday, July 21st, the administration entered into a settlement agreement with opponents of U.S. energy production that will remove 10 million plus highly prospective acres from the forthcoming offshore lease sale in the Gulf of Mexico. This is an apparent end around of the requirements of the Inflation Reduction Act, and it completely circumvents the established regulatory process for governing the issues that were raised in litigation. Congressional efforts should be considered to restrict these types of sue and settle or regulation by litigation tactics that bypass Congress and the public process and jeopardize U.S. energy production. Also, under the Inflation Reduction Act, periodic offshore oil and gas lease sales are now required in order for Interior to issue offshore wind leases. Many of the same companies that built the offshore oil and gas sector are now participating in the build-out of the offshore wind sector. A steady stream of offshore oil and gas and offshore wind lease sales is needed for the supply chain to fully realize these incredible opportunities before us. We encourage this committee to consider legislation that will serve to preserve the future of offshore leasing for both oil and gas and wind. The good news is that the members of this committee have introduced and supported legislative proposals to help overcome the administrative roadblocks to energy investment. The Offshore Energy Security Act of 2023, the Building American Energy Security Act of 2023, and the Spur Permitting of Underdeveloped Resources Act are all examples of smart legislation that can help knock down barriers to investment. Whether it is in West Virginia, Wyoming, or the Gulf of Mexico, our future energy security depends upon a reasonable, workable, and streamlined federal regulatory framework for all forms of energy. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. And I look forward to your questions. Now, Ms. Senator Barrasso. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to welcome to the committee today Mr. Peter Obermuller, who has one of our witnesses at today's hearings. Uh, we've known each other a long time. His father's in the Wyoming legislature. He uh, represents my home community. Pete, uh, thanks for traveling here to Casper. We were on the same flight uh, yesterday. You were sitting next to Senator Risch, who wanted to stay here and listen, and unfortunately had another engagement in the Foreign Relations Committee. The, uh, we appreciate you being with us at the nation's capital. You're a Wyoming native, attended Natrona County High School in Casper, went on to graduate from uh, Concordia University in St. Paul, and then received a master's degree in public policy from the University of Minnesota. Uh, since 2019, Pete has served as the president of the Petroleum Association of Wyoming. Uh, for years, he served previously here on Capitol Hill as a legislative director to now Senator Lummis uh, when she was in the House of Representatives. And prior to that, he served as a staff member for Wyoming's representative, Barbara Cuban. Uh, Pete is an expert on the issues facing oil and gas operators on federal land in the West. We're so grateful for the opportunity to hear from you today. Thanks so much for joining us. I look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Obamano. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Barrasso, members of the Energy and Natural Resource Committee. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you regarding the leasing and permitting challenges on federal lands. I want to emphasize a few specific obstacles and policy prescriptions today, but it all boils down to one thing. American energy producers can and will invest on federal land production, but to do so, they need predictability and reliability in our regulatory and judicial processes. In Wyoming, the efficient and effective government oversight is not a theoretical question because the federal government controls nearly three quarters of Wyoming's mineral resources. In 2022, the oil and natural gas industry provided over $2.34 billion in tax revenue to Wyoming. Now, Wyoming is a small state with a small budget. So to put that in perspective, that's 67% of the state's two-year general fund budget. Oil and gas is Wyoming's primary economic driver but the federal government is in the driver's seat. It's no secret that the Biden administration has severely, severely curtailed leases of federal acres since 2021, but now that uh, leases have at least nominally restarted, it's important that this committee understand the ways that the BLM continues to minimize lease availability and avoid the issuance of permits. Even in the best of times, the BLM's decision-making regarding what leases are available is opaque, but the current process is even worse. After offering no leases at all in 2021, the BLM now is deferring leases in extraordinary numbers. 462 parcels covering more than half a million acres have been deferred without reasonable explanations as to why and with no guidance on how to remove them from this limbo status. 
An egregious but not a unique example is depicted in this map of an actual project in Wyoming today. The squares are, of course, one mile sections containing 640 acres each. Every single acre in this map is already leased for oil and gas development, save the ones I'll mention. Focus your attention on the yellow areas. These sections are leased for development from one single company, but note the two donut holes in the middle of the yellow block. These acres were deferred by the BLM in the most recent lease sale, making production in the surrounding yellow areas functionally unavailable. What compelling reason exists to prompt deferral of the donut holes in an already leased field that doesn't exist elsewhere in the field? The BLM has denied requests to make those areas available under an agreement that there would be no surface disturbance at all. Neither has the BLM outlined a process to release those acres for bid. So a company now pays $5 an acre to nominate a parcel that may never be offered at all or put in a deferral purgatory with no process for removal. Once these leases are secured, operators must then undergo lengthy and expensive work to meet all the requirements necessary to earn a permit to drill. Permits are an essential component of drilling programs, so efficiency and processing is always an issue. Lately, the BLM's performance has lagged as processing times have increased 124% since 2018, rising to 271 days. What is new and alarming is the BLM, on its own volition, is withholding permits on acreage subject to litigation, even if the court has not enjoined the issuance of permits. Approximately two million acres are languishing in this self-enjoined status. Now, self-enjoining is a real problem, but it's understandable in this one sense. The agency has an extreme bunker mentality resulting from the onslaught of litigation on their every decision that approves human activity on federal land. Nearly every lease in Wyoming and every single permit issued since 2021 is, subject, is the subject of litigation. Recently completed resource management plan amendment in Converse County is an example. After nearly seven years of collaborative work, the BLM issued a decision that provides for careful protection of wildlife and sustainable energy development. It's clever and creative. These are two words not usually used to describe the BLM. But unfortunately, after inexplicably waiting for two years, notorious activist litigators have now filed to overturn that amended plan. Well, recent congressional attention on the paralytic state of permitting is encouraging, but so long as policy decisions are made in the closed confines of a courtroom instead of the halls of Congress, the job is not complete. The good news is most of what I've discussed can be immediately corrected with passage of, of the SPUR Act. That legislation would restore predictability by making leasing and permitting more consistent, stable, and timely, and I urge its passing. Finally, Mr. Chairman, the development of affordable, reliable energy has done more to advance human flourishing than any other development in history. I'm enormously proud of Wyoming's 100-year con contributions to providing energy to all Americans. We all know that global production of oil and natural gas is going to continue for decades to come. I worry that Wyoming will be disallowed from playing its part. This committee can help ensure Wyoming's energy future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Speaks Bachman. Hello, and thank you, uh, Chairman Manchin, uh, Ranking Member Barrasso, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. Invenergy is a leading developer, owner, and operator of clean energy solutions and has led the clean energy transition and advanced American energy independence for more than 20 years. We've, successfully, uh, we've successively developed more than 200 projects, 45 of which are in states represented by members of this committee. Uh, we have also have six projects uh, currently under development on public lands and offshore. As one of the largest American clean energy developers, it will be no surprise to you when I say we need predictable and transparent permitting processes to build the next generation of clean energy projects. We therefore welcome the recent bipartisan efforts to examine this issue and identify needed reforms. As part of any legislative reform, however, we must also preserve and prioritize meaningful engagement with tribal nations, landowners, and local communities. Invenergy is a leader, actually, of, in robust community engagement approaches, and we look forward to answering any questions you might have about how we incorporate this engagement into our project budgets and planning. Now, given that the topic of this panel is permitting on federal lands, we want to identify that we found what we found to be challenges in constructing energy infrastructure in federal public lands and waters, and what we believe to be reasonable and practical solutions to enable implementation. 
So first, we support policies that encourage responsible renewable energy development on suitable Bureau of Land Management lands. For example, BLM's proposed renewable energy rule would ease the burden on energy developers by reducing the cost of leasing federal public lands. BLM could further spur development by taking common sense measures like revising its programmatic EIS for solar planning to prioritize set siting projects on lands that are near planned or existing transmission infrastructure. In addition to these substantive reforms, agencies like BLM and, the, and BOEM, the Bureau of Energy, Ocean Energy Management, need sufficient and consistent resources to ensure that they can efficiently evaluate project authorization in a timely manner. Second, offshore wind developers and the offshore wind supply chain need greater certainty and predictability to be able to take on these major private uh, investment risks. The offshore wind industry is expected to support 80, up to 83,000 American jobs by 2030, but only if offshore lease sales occur on a regular schedule and projects are permitted without delay. Companies must be able to plan and budget years in advance in order to make these massive investments, but it's not going to happen until lease sales are conducted on a consistent basis and the per permitting process is efficient and predictable. Finally, we have to do more faster on interregional transmission. As we saw during Winter Storm Elliott and Winter Storm Uri and the multitude of summer and winter weather events before that, Threats to our electric grid pose a risk to our homes, our hospitals, our military bases, and industries, and extreme, in extreme cases to human lives. The most widely recognized but underutilized major scale solution is interregional inter transmission, which enables imports and exports across regions to move power from where it's needed, or from where it's available to where it's needed most. Unfortunately, today, federal policy does not adequately facilitate interregional transmission. Existing processes for planning have been largely ineffectual because they don't set meaningful and measurable targets, they don't require cooperation between regions, and they don't qualify reliability, resilience, and operational benefits, and I should say quantify. So, but fortunately, members of this committee uh, have proposed legislation to address these issues by pr providing clear framework, to value interregional transmissions benefits through your bill, uh, Chairman Manchin, um, to require FERC to develop planning processes for national interest transmission lines through Senator Heinrich's proposal, and to third, to require each region to have a defined percentage of import and export capability with neighboring regions through Senator Hickenlooper's proposal. All of these are bipartisan solutions and should be on the table. So in conclusion, uh, we're at an important inflection point. We have an opportunity to make the reforms and the investments necessary to maintain American energy dominance in the 21st century, creating millions of jobs here at home, uh, and ensuring that American companies like Invenergy can continue to lead the clean energy transmission transition. So thank you for the opportunity to address you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Let me say thank all of you for being here, and I appreciate it, and your statements are well taken. Uh, as you all know, we passed the Inflation Reduction Act uh, in a balanced approach, trying to look at how we could have an all-in energy policy, but also have the security that we needed for the energy that we had right here in our backyard. We weren't going in that direction. We think that bill basically was directing uh, this government and this administration to get back on track. Uh, so with that, uh, I can't understand that it's pretty simple that solar and wind on federal lands and waters, they can't proceed. Uh, unless we're holding meaningful oil and gas cell leases. They all go together. And if they think one without the other is going to happen, it won't. Uh, it appears that uh, renewables and oil and gas both face the same challenges uh, of not having consistent sales. Onshore, the administration cannot sign agreements for more than 20 wind and solar projects currently under review because they haven't met the IRA's oil and gas lease sell requirements. We did this on purpose. We wanted, we're all in this together. We've got to make sure we have reliable, affordable, dependable energy. And so how important is it, I mean, to get off the dime here? Do you all work with both sides of the aisle here trying to figure, hey, we are all in this together? And have you had conversations with people who are protesting, objecting, and stopping and suing that they're basically killing themselves, shooting themselves in the foot? Mr. Melito? Yeah, we're constantly in conversation with uh, members of both sides of the aisle, Senate do they and House. Know how, do they know, I mean, the advocates from who want no oil and gas leases at all, okay, or coal production whatsoever, do they know that basically it's all tied in inextricably to 
I don't believe do there's uh, that level of understanding of the provisions of the IRA and, and, and how they're going to impact the future of wind leasing, both onshore and offshore. We're trying to make sure we educate everybody on that, and we're trying to make sure there's some urgency around moving forward with the oil and gas sales so nothing is impeded as we move forward. These are projects that are... Um, the competition for the money behind these projects is global. We don't want to lose that. We don't want to see that go to other parts right. of the world. We want that here in the U.S., and that's what we're trying to convey. What do you see, Mr. Over, Overmill? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think, as you well know, we, we are actively in conversation with, with all sorts of people about these issues on federal lands. I'm I sure think you in terms all have studied groups, the bills. You, you three probably have studied that bill as well as if anybody you know, and, and it was pretty clear what the intent was of, that, of the Inflation Reduction Act. And it should, hopefully, I, do you all believe it was a balanced approach to what, how we produce energy in our country and having the, revo, you know, the uh, results, basically, from an energy policy that would work? It was a balanced approach, and it was a very good start, yes. I think I divide the, the, the folks that I'm talking about in my testimony into two camps, those that want to have a serious discussion about infrastructure for all sources of energy, of which Wyoming provides every source, right. and those that don't, they, they just want to spend the time in the courtroom. I believe that the invest inflation, inflation Re Reduction Act was um, an amazing step toward creating more clean energy and being able to work on a bipartisan level to get that forward. Now, as in Venergy, we, we don't have oil and gas lease in right. mind, but we believe that we need to do everything. You understand you can't have what you want Absolutely. unless we're doing we what we need. We believe that we need. It is critical to take all necessary steps to ensure continued offshore wind lease sales. Okay. Um, I know producers in Wyoming are concerned about the administration withhold some of the most productive areas from oil and gas leasing, and I share your concerns. At the same time, I'm concerned about proposals which restrict Interior from withholding any areas from leasing because many of our federal lands are managed for multiple use, which includes hunting, fishing, hiking, off-road vehicles, timber grazing, and more. Uh, there's a big difference between land being available for leasing versus land that must be leased upon request. So what are your suggestions for legislation uh, that would uh, ensure producers aren't only offered unwanted acreage, but also protects other uses of federal lands. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that question, Mr. Chairman. I, I think, again, to your point, we can strike a balance there. The, the Bureau of Land Management was created to, uh, to provide. Well, the donut hole you showed on your map was very, very, to me, compelling and very interesting. They intentionally, cleverly did this basically to prevent, I'm sure, it's going to be horizontal drilling, correct? I know Correct. exactly what it was for. That's precisely why it becomes unavailable in those yellow blocks, because you need the, you need the space know. to horizontal drill. It got you stopped completely. Right. So the SPUR Act does take care of some of this in the sense that it, it, it requires, it does not require 100% of, of uh, acceding to what industry has asked for in terms of nominated acres. But it does ask for some sort of coherence in what industry thinks is a, a reasonable place to develop and issuing leases uh, at least in part based on that. And, and that's a reasonable balance, I think, that we can find, and there's legislation in, in front of you that does that. We might want you to keep that map or leave it here with us, so we'll bring BLM back in and let them answer that. Uh, no further questions. Senator Brasso? Oh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Obrino, so the BLM has held just two oil and gas lease sales in Wyoming since Joe Biden took office. Uh, the Mineral Leasing Act requires quarterly lease sales, meaning there should be had, should have been 10 sales under President Biden so far. So I have a chart up here that uh, shows the average amount of acres leased, and it's in uh, millions of acres, by previous presidents. Well, you can see uh, Joe Biden right there at the bottom uh, is defying the law and has wrecked the leasing process. Can you talk about the impact that this BLM refusal to follow the law has had on the state of Wyoming? Thank you, Senator Barrasso. Uh, thanks for the question. Happy to do so. I want to answer it in two ways. Number one, just the, the, the fiscal impact to the state of Wyoming. I mentioned how important oil and gas is to our economy and to Wyoming's revenues. Uh, the two lease sales that the administration has offered, uh, the first uh, brought in 14 million, the second brought in 13 million. At that rate, you've mentioned that they've missed 10. Uh, Wyoming should have been uh, receiving somewhere, or Wyoming and the federal government should have been receiving around $130 million. So there's, there's a quantifiable dollar amount impact for sure. The second part that I want to emphasize, Senator, is uh, the issue of leasing for Wyoming has everything to do with the exploration 
not necessarily the production. I was so encouraged to hear Senator Manchin differentiate between leasing and permitting in that way. Wyoming is an exploratory field still. It's different from other fields in that sense. We need leasing in order to explore for new fields. That's what attracts companies to Wyoming is that exploratory nature. And as we cut off leasing and cut that down, we choke off the ability to explore for new resources. And that hurts us in the long term. So the failure to lease federal lands result in less oil and gas production or simply cause companies to move elsewhere? Right. It, 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 in terms of the expense and in terms of leasing, if, there, if, if, if companies have production in other basins, of course, Colorado or New Mexico or other places, they fight internally for capital. And the barriers that BLM puts in front of Wyoming puts us at a competitive disadvantage. So, Mr. Molito, do you see the same reaction from companies in offshore oil and gas sectors? Yeah, the offshore sector is highly competitive. It makes up about 30% of total global oil production, which is you know, 100 million barrels a day. And th these are projects that are that they're competing on a, on a global level. You're looking at um, places like Guyana, Southeast Asia, you know, the North Sea. Uh, it's very um, difficult and challenging to continue to make investments in, in a region like the Gulf of Mexico that is highly prospective when you have uncertainty, uncertainty and, and you don't have the predictability that you might have in another part of the world. So the money could definitely leave and, you know, you put those jobs at risk. Yeah. So, Mr. Obermeer, you talked about activists having challenged essentially every oil and gas lease sale that uh, BLM has held in Wyoming. They include lease sales uh, held by you know, even held by the Obama administration. The lawsuits are often filed years after the leases have been issued. Uh, these groups ask judges to cancel leases that are valid existing contracts between BLM and private companies. How do these lawsuits affect your members' ability to produce on federal land? In some cases, uh, Senator Brasso, in some cases it completely stops the ability to produce. Uh, currently there are uh, 2,573 leases under litigation in Wyoming. Uh, in some cases, in many cases, it, it uh, has prompted the BLM to, as I mentioned before, self-enjoin. But perhaps one of the most egregious examples of that is, is legally uh, the leases offered in, in the fourth quarter of 2020. The legal process was completed. The uh, leases were available. But for fear of litigation, the BLM has yet to actually issue those leases from Q4 2020 as a result of, of litigation threats. So, so to, to make that point, since Joe Biden has taken office, BLM has decided to stop issuing permits on oil and gas leases that are under litigation. That's what you just said. The, uh, so often BLM has made this decision even though environmental activists have not actually won a ruling in court. So as a result, companies have not been able to develop hundreds of thousands of acres in Wyoming based on this decision. As a matter of basic fairness, should environmental activists get what they want without actually winning in court? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it does defy a little bit of explanation. Uh, it, you know, obviously access to courts is very, very important, but the process should play out and there, there should not be an incentive to continually to file lawsuits and then have, uh, have an agency self-enjoin uh, during that process. The process should play out and it should play out fairly. So Mr. Melito, the Biden administration set a goal to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2035. I'll note that offshore wind requires over 33,000 pounds of minerals per megawatt of capacity. It's about 12 times the amount of minerals that natural gas needs per megawatt. Does the United States have policies in place to support the development of mineral resources that offshore wind energy needs? Well, we, we lack a comprehensive strategy for securing the critical minerals needed for our energy, energy future. We need to work together to make sure that China does not remain the dominant player in, in this space. Uh, we, ha we have companies that can do offshore mineral mining, and th they w would be helped by the administration if they stepped up and, and, and played a role in getting them access to some of these areas around the world where they're trying to deploy their technologies to, to have a U.S. company in that space. And uh, you're very well aware the you know, state of Wyoming has various critical minerals, and the BLM, of course, has a lot of jurisdiction over that that prevents that kind of development. But SPUR Act has provisions in there to, to address a lot of this, and we need to work together to develop this comprehensive strategy so that the U.S. becomes a leader in critical mineral mining. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm going to ask, um, really, uh, Ms. Speaks Bachman, uh, uh, kind of to focus on this for me and help me out here. So in Nevada, there are 96 pending applications um, to deploy solar projects statewide. 51 of them are in southern Nevada. 
uh, there is a growing bottleneck. One of the things I constantly hear, and you touched on it a little, both from BLM officials and from Nevadans and those that are trying to do the project, is the bottleneck um, is caused to some extent by understaffing or a lack of staffing at our local BLM offices to be able to move the permitting along. Now, with that said, I also know in the Inflation Reduction Act, Congress provided uh, about $150 million to the Interior Department to support that environmental review and permitting, to move it through quickly. Uh, my question to you is, what are we missing here? Uh, is it an inability to hire these individuals? Because they have the money, BLM has the money to do it. Is it a lack of interest? Is it an inability to hire that workforce? What are you hearing and seeing on the ground when it actually matters to, to move these permits along? Thank you for so much for this question, mm -hmm. because I do believe uh, when it comes to federal land permitting or permitting generally, it is really the, the biggest impediment that we have to this is staffing, mm -hmm. is being able to get the right folks in the, on the, uh, at the, their desks uh, and working, and, and the right training involved to make sure that that pipeline is involved. Um, the, the, the renewable energy, um, the RICO uh, offices that are throughout the United States are um, woefully understaffed, frankly. And I'm not sure that it's necessarily a um, lack of interest. It takes a long time to hire within the federal government, as I'm sure you're very well Absolutely. aware. Um, but it also takes um, a more steady level. Like, as these as these agencies like BOEM and BLM and NOAA are working towards goals such as 30 gigawatts or 25 gigawatts by 2025 on federal lands, as they're trying to work towards that, staffing takes a long time. And we absolutely, we have the funding there now, thankfully, through right. the leadership of this uh, program. We just need to be able to, um, in, in, for example, in the IIJA, there was uh, creative ways of, create, of, of creating um, uh, employment uh, uh, em employment statuses where you could hire a lot faster. And it is simply, you have to be able to get these sorts of different types of hires mm -hmm. rather than just the federal employees to get the hiring done faster. Yeah, and, and that's what I would be interested in hearing from our, our folks at Interior, is what can we do to streamline that process? Because it is a challenge, I hear, because of the rules at the federal level. But if we are really, the funding is out there, they have the ability to actually make the hires. It's just getting through the process much quicker and moving it. And, and perhaps some detailing, creative mm -hmm. detailing. There are, we have a number of um, ideas that I, I'm happy to forward to you um, afterwards, but uh, you can detail from one agency to the other. And, and also I would say that solar and wind, and um, I would suggest also for geothermal expertise throughout mm -hmm. the country. I think that's a really important element as well. And thank you, because I know, uh, and this is something I have been uh, pushing, uh, again, to support, is the really growing opportunities around geothermal, not just in Nevada, but across the country. There's so much potential. Uh, but as we continue these projects, as we are hearing, there is a backlog. Uh, and it, first step for me is to start with the agency itself. The funding's there, but how do we get them, how do we make it easy for them to hire, and how do we get more people in the pipeline? It's, it is mm -hmm. the number one impediment in my mind for clean energy development on federal lands is being able to get the right people in the right place to have have the full resources and have steady resources across years to be able to retain that talent and to retain the processes keeping in time. Thank you. And then I only have so much time left, but I also um, picked up on, on your statement, uh, which I think is important, and thank you, uh, Invenergy uh, is in Nevada. Thank you. I was at one of the ribbon cuttings with the MGM and um, uh, one of the AEP renewables, but you talked about uh, local community engagement, how, it is, how important it is to have that community engagement, uh, local, federal, and tribal nations. Um, and I guess my question to you is, how can that be used for a model, particularly now that we have that new uh, federal office within FERC, the Office of Public Participation? Can you talk a little bit about the importance of that community engagement and why it matters? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, it, 
it is incredibly important. And the success of our projects and any project um, depends on our ability to really build trust with those communities and not just tell them why we're in their town and, and why we're going to be doing good for them, but hearing from them what are their needs, what are their priorities, how can we support both financially but also getting the end goal of the project, uh, getting, you know, making sure we're on the same page. It is incredibly important. And not only is it important to make sure that we're accepted, but it can help accelerate the permitting process, and it can help accelerate um, if you have the community behind you. It can help get those projects done more quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. President Biden, uh, flanked by a veritable army of unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats, have made their goal very, very clear. Their goal is to hinder fossil fuel production on federal lands and in federal waters by any and every means necessary. And they're doing quite a job of it. Um, in, in tandem with the climate provisions of the Orwellian named Inflation Reduction Act, which congressional Democrats passed last summer, new regulations are coming out of the Department of Interior, the EPA, CEQ, and even agencies like the Securities Exchange Commission of chilled capital investment of oil, gas, and coal production. This at a particularly inopportune time. You know, the, the Democrats' war on fossil fuels has only added more risk, more uncertainty, more suffering um, uh, to this process and, and to the countless permitting obstacles that energy projects were already facing. Uh, and this is contributing to a situation in which energy prices and inflation um, uh, are making Americans even poorer, uh, at the same time when they're suffering from the rampant inflation that we have faced over the last two and a half years because of excessive federal spending and excessive federal regulatory intervention. Instead of allowing American operators to produce domestically, the Biden administration has done everything that it possibly can to slow domestic oil and gas production to try to appease the radical fringe elements of the environmental lobby while groveling to Venezuela and Saudi Arabia for more oil supply to try to bring down prices for a moment for short-term political gain. This strategy makes absolutely no sense. We've got boundless domestic oil and gas reserves that are far better, environmentally speaking, and far better for Americans, economically speaking. Substantive regulatory and permitting reform is indeed long overdue. And so I'm glad we're having this conversation today, and I thank the chairman for convening the hearing. Uh, Mr. Uh, Obermuller, I'd like to, to start with you. Uh, as environmental groups have increased their opposition to the production of oil and natural gas on federal lands over the last 25 years. Perhaps it comes as no surprise that in FY 2022, for the first time, 100% of the parcels posted for sale, uh, where there were leases going on, um, uh, were protested and litigated, 100%. That had never happened before. This kind of litigation, of course, targets permits, leases, licenses, uh, uh, permits uh, uh, for drilling and so forth, uh, and of course, NEPA analysis for wells, gathering lines, and, and pipelines. In a bill that uh, I have called the Unshackle Act, uh, I try to reform the NEPA process. Um, this is a bill that I've introduced in the past and that I'll be um, reintroducing in Congress uh, again soon. And I've proposed a, a uniform 150-day statute of limitations for all NEPA-related claims, uh, a, 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 along with tightening the requirements necessary in order to obtain prompt judicial review. Could you describe how these judicial reforms would add some more certainty to the permitting process uh, for, for oil and gas projects? 
Senator Lee, thank you for the question. I, I think as you've pointed out in your remarks that we need to acknowledge that we have perhaps inadvertently, but we certainly have established a system that incentivizes and rewards driving policy changes through the judicial branch. And whether it's your act, I know that I've, I've seen iterations of that and appreciate that work uh, and, and other efforts specifically regarding taxpayer funding of reimbursements for litigation. Um, we have to find ways to curtail that incentive and reward structure for repeated litigation, not intended to correct an injustice necessarily, we all want access to courts for that, but to correct, but to so-called correct procedural issues, really whatever you can come up with because there's no skin in the game to repeatedly uh, you know, file lawsuits on 100% of these projects. Right, it's all gain at that point because if you, if you file it, you'll delay it. If you delay it, it may never happen. It might disappear and then in the meantime, the BLM comes out and proposes this new rule earlier this week, which would uh, hike royalty and, and rental rates, increase the bond and minimum bid amounts, and then establish a new fee for expressions of interest. And, and well, th these uh, cost increases are garnering most of the attention surrounding the rule, and rightly so. I'm concerned about the preference criteria uh, in the rule, which would give BLM even more discretion to direct oil and gas leasing toward areas that, quote, do not have sensitive cultural, wildlife, and recreation interests. Um, this worries me because I mean, it's going to create yet more discretion that will be used to discriminate even more at will against states where the president knows he is not going to lose many friends anyway because he doesn't have many, and where there happens to be a whole lot of federal land. And that description, that profile starts to look a lot like Utah and Wyoming and a handful of other states. Um, this is worrisome to me. So how challenging will it be for producers in light of this rule with high development potential um, uh, that, that the BLM does not arbitrarily deem to have cultural, wildlife, or recreational resources? Senator, it's challenging, and I would add one more to that list that I think is important, is, is one of the criteria that they're looking at, of course, is is that the BLM would define what has high potential for development, low versus high potential. Uh, you know, in Utah, from the Uinta Basin, and we know, of course, know in Wyoming, every single acre at one point was low potential until technology made it high potential. So having the BLM be the arbiter of what has low and high potential is not the path we want to go down. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate your putting the time and the effort. Um, let me start with uh, Ms. Speaks Backman. Uh, your company's building out a, a whole new energy generation that uh, we're going to rely on for decades, I assume. Uh, right now, new projects, though, are coming online. Uh, the, the, the new projects that are coming online face long studies, incredible costs to connect, sometimes into the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, uh, along with Representative Scott Peters, uh, we've been uh, working on a forthcoming bill, the Big Wires Act, that would require a minimum amount of transmission between regions. How would something like the Big Wires Act that helps break that logjam, uh, how would it add to kind of uh, facilitating wind, solar, gas, and storage projects uh, that are piling up in interconnection queues and what would that mean for reliability and affordability? Yes, well, um, first of all, thank you for your work and your leadership on the Big Wires Act. We um, at Invenergy are um, highly supportive of the bill on um, setting a minimum criteria for import and export capacity. Um, you know, transmission helps accommodate new generation projects, um, which uh, in turn help to uh, strengthen the grid. It is a symbiotic relationship, if you will. Uh, an example of how transmission um, can really help 
to, uh, to accommodate new generation project is in Texas, the CREZ program, uh, where exactly they constructed more than 2,000 miles of transmission lines in addition to the 18,000 megawatts of clean energy projects that they put together, new energy projects put together for consumers, which lowered prices, it helped reliability and resilience, and it is exactly the type of measurable and um, I would say metric-driven transmission build-out, as well as um, new technologies to make existing transmission more efficient that is important to help spur more generation uh, on the clean energy side, especially. Exactly. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Melito, um, although Colorado is not a coastal state today, um, as a former geologist, I like to remind people that at one time we had prime coastal real estate. Um, we certainly recognize that offshore resources like offshore wind are a big part of our country's energy future. Um, right now, we're losing that race to China. The statistics they, they gave to me was that uh, had China had installed more offshore wind capacity in 2021 than the rest of the world did in the previous five years. Um, how can America better tap into its rich offshore resources to continue to diversify diversify our energy mix? Yeah, thank you for the question. One of the areas where we need increased certainty and predictability is in the ability to get acreage through leasing. Uh, right now, there's um, some of the questions that were raised earlier about the tie between oil and gas and between offshore wind. So let's make sure we work together to create schedules for leasing for both oil and gas and wind so that we can continue to allow both to thrive. Uh, the administration has done, a, done a, a, a strong job of pushing forward with the construction operation plan approvals for these projects. So they're coming online, they're still in the water, and we're beginning to see a lot of excitement around uh, the prospects for continued approvals and for continued construction of these projects. Uh, I do think we do need to make sure we're keeping an eye on some of the Inflation Reduction Act incentives to make sure that they're being um, distributed and implemented in a way that, you know, we take full advantage of the ability to provide those incentives to, to this industry. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll come back to Ms. Speaks uh, Backman. Um, uh, recently, Tom Tillis, Senator Tillis, Senator Tom Tillis and I uh, filed a bipartisan amendment to the NDAA which would have had the Department of Defense investigate risks to mission readiness if, there, if we had in, an inadequate ability to move power between regions at home. So again, getting back to that, you know, the, the sense of large-scale transition, how could, what role could that play in helping ensure power, power supply to critical infrastructure like our military bases at home? Well, certainly um, grid reliability impacts uh, all, all aspects of our economy, but especially our security and our, our national security and defense. Uh, there was a statistic, I'd, I'd have to look that up, something along the lines of uh, 6,000, let me make sure I have the right notes, it's something along the lines of 6,000 outages in the last two years at military facilities. Um, and that's not acceptable. It, it does impact our national readiness, and that means we need a more efficient grid, we need more reliability, and we need measurable, uh, measurable um, elements of uh, the, the, the planning system that help us to figure out what the reliability and resilience, uh, w resilience levels need to be in order to protect our, our country. Right. Great. Thank you, and I guess I'm, I'm out of time, so I'll yield back to the I had, as an exploration geologist, I had a couple of good questions, but I'll put them in in writing. Back to the chair. Senator Hoven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, clearly, it's time to reform our broken federal permitting process. Delays and uncertainty drive up the cost of projects, and opponents are exploding a more and more complicated permitting process uh, to the extent that, so to the point where delay becomes defeat, and you've, you've uh, highlighted that very well. U.S. consumers pay the price for this regulatory uncertainty, particularly through higher energy costs. It affects everybody. Increasing supply is key to lowering energy costs and attacking inflation, and we need to empower our energy producers with a clear, consistent, and timely federal permitting process. To that end, I've introduced three bills. One is the Bureau of Land Management, BLM Mineral Spacing Act, which would remove duplicative BLM permitting regs and better respect the rights of private uh, mineral owners. 
Also, the North American Energy Act, which would prevent unnecessary delays for cross-border pipeline and transmission line projects, and promoting interagency coordination for review of National Gas Projects Act, which would streamline and set deadlines for multi-agency NEPA reviews of natural gas pipelines and LNG projects. And I appreciate our ranking member uh, for including all of these in the SPUR Act, uh, which I'm also co-sponsoring. Uh, co so, Mr. Obermuller, uh, for you, uh, just starting with my BLM Mineral Spacing Act, uh, again, the basic uh, concept, and, and this committee actually has passed the act uh, through the committee, but it would remove duplicative um, application for permit to drill requirements when federal government owns no surface land and a minority of the mineral interest, right? And uh, so, I mean, there, you know, you're the adjacent uh, landowner, you own the minerals, uh, you're being held up, you're the mineral owner in that parcel, right? or may share in it, you may be the landowner. The, the uh, BLM has no surface ownership, yet they sit and hold it up with the federal requirements rather than allowing the state to uh, move forward. Do you agree that removing this duplicative permitting requirement states with a split mineral estate would help empower more energy development and enable BLM to better utilize its resources and frankly bring some fairness to private owners who are disenfranchised unfairly by the federal government? Senator Hoban, I, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that question. And uh, I mentioned earlier about, about technology making resources available that weren't previously available. Horizontal drilling uh, techniques have resulted in an issue that you just brought up that requires congressional attention to fix, and that is precisely what you talked about. Uh, drill pads and energy projects can be miles away from federal, uh, from federal minerals, and they can have, the federal government cannot own the surface at all in any of it, and still, from a minority of a nexus, dictate management prescriptions on private and state land. That is a, a dramatic expansion of the BLM's authority beyond the lands that they own. It's very critical to Wyoming and to North Dakota, I know. And it's absolutely unfair, isn't it? I mean, we have pads where you could have, they may be up to 24 wells, I don't know, but 16 to, or more wells on a pad, and they drill out three or more miles in all directions underground so there's no surface interruption whatsoever. Those kind of things can be held up by the federal government uh, in, in the kind of cases we're talking about where they don't even own surface acres, right? Absolutely can, and in terms of the, the litigation discussion we've been having before, there, there, are, uh, there are litigators who are trying to force it the other way, who require the federal government to actually have management prescriptions and authority on private and state land. Which That's actually empowers Congress. the kind of strategy you just talked about where they may take a section and actually prevent a much larger project even though they only own a minority interest in, in a small part of it. Precisely. And then just recently, last week, BLM issued proposed regulations that would further limit oil and gas leasing and increase the cost of energy production on federal lands. Uh, your testimony raises concerns that this proposal dries up the cost of energy production on federal lands and is layered upon a lengthy and uncertain federal permitting process already in place. Do the administration's policies towards federal energy production encourage or discourage your members from using increase in production, and at a time when everybody's fighting inflation and energy is a big part of that, won't this new regulation further hurt our ability to produce energy in this country versus getting it from other countries who may be hostile to our interests and have much worse environmental stewardship? And does that make any sense whatsoever? Senator Hovind, I appreciate that question. And I think you're referring to the new bonding uh, rule that they uh, uh, proposed last week. And what I would say is, um, it absolutely does discourage, and in part because it's a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, in Wyoming, we, basically, we have very small companies. Uh, a third of Wyoming's oil production is produced by 400 companies that individually produce less than 2% of the total. Proposals like the BLM's last week will hurt those companies the most very expensive and there's no opportunity like we have in Wyoming to go into a regulator like I know what they do in, in, uh, in, in North Dakota and work on a cost-based bonding system, not a blanket bond that, uh, that where there's no room to talk about what it costs to reclaim well at any depth. Yeah, and as, you said, as you said, in many cases, these are small businesses, right, that are the most impacted. 
the, the impact of a lot of these regulations is, is further consolidation to the biggest oil and gas operators. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Speaks back when I, I want to talk about permitting, and, and we've talked, we're talking about firm, federal permitting and BLM and leasing and all of that. But a lot of the issues in energy development are local permitting, state permitting. And one of my observations is that often you'll have a project such as the ones you sponsor that have a global benefit but a local impact. The strategy that, I, I, I don't know if you're aware, but prior to my life here, I was an energy developer in hydro, biomass, wind power, conservation. We, we, dis, we tried to provide a specific local benefit yes. to the people who bear the impact of the project. Talk to me about that concept. Absolutely. As part of our early and often strategy for uh, local, uh, local um, uh, interaction and, and community engagement, we very much look for not only how this project should be cited or how this project should be uh, built, and, and, but what are the needs of the community, either in, uh, in conjunction with the uh, objectives of the project itself, or what are, what are the company com what do the communities need that are uh, not necessarily related to the energy project or the transmission project that we're building? And so we go through a very rigorous prog process of first planning community engagement and then executing on that community engagement. And, and um, part of that is, is, as you say, determining what the community needs and if the project can meet those needs. I, I think that's, that, that's an important concept because saying this is going to benefit the, the earth doesn't help a resident of a community that's going to see or experience the project. Uh, I just want to emphasize something you've talked with Senator Cortez Masto about, and that is the lack of staff. And that's throughout this process, whether it's at the yes. state level, the national level, and a lot of these delays, they're not people who are sitting on their hands, they just, there's just too much. Uh, and I take it you're nodding, but the record won't show you're nodding. I take it you agree. I agree a thousand percent. Um, I have had the privilege to work with uh, federal employees at the Department of Energy in my past, and I have never seen a harder working set of folks to work toward the mission of the agency itself. And I think that's across all of, all of government. Uh, this is why one of the primary um, uh, issues for us or the priorities for us on when it comes to permitting is really making sure that these folks are well staffed and consistently staffed. Particularly if you're going to shorten deadlines. Absolutely. Or we're going to increase the scope. So as they have to do more work, we've got to make sure that on a steady basis, so they're not, the, the few folks that are there in the office aren't spending time training the new folks coming in, right? We, we need to keep a consistent level of staffing. Let me change the subject slightly, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Melito, you may want to comment on this. It's always bothered me that in NEPA and other kinds of environmental analysis, you're looking at the impact of the project but there's no analysis of the benefit, the environmental benefit of the project. You can have a project with 100 units of environmental benefit and eight units of detriment, but that's all the focus. Do you yes. think it would be useful, important, and good policy to have NEPA and the other environmental laws that assess impact to assess the positive virtues of the project as against any detriment? Absolutely. As a, as a former state regulator as well, uh, it is the net benefits that really are what count. Um, can, you, ha you have to take look, a look at both sides of the ledger, but the net benefits really are something that you need to take a look at. It's not just what the impact is, but what are the positive outputs. Mr. Melito, do you agree? Oh, absolutely. There are so many factors that should be considered in a decision like this, energy affordability, national security, employment, uh, we oftentimes the world have the ability. requires trade-offs, does it not? Ab absolutely. You do you need to balance all the factors and determine the best approach to moving forward with a project based on a consideration of those factors. Uh, Mr. Obermuller, a question. We talked a lot about litigation. Uh, one of the things that was in discussion last year about uh, these permitting reform proposals was shortening the period of the statute of limitations on these actions. Do people, do litigants wait out the statute of limitations and then file at the end, therefore extending the period even further? What's your view on shortening the statute of limitations on, on uh, appeals of administrative action? Senator, thank you for the question. I certainly support shortening the statute of limitations. Bring, bring that action closer to the final decision of the federal agency. So you're not, we're not talking about keeping people out of court. We're just saying 
you can't sit on your on on your rights. That's uh, correct. And what about uh, some provision to move these cases to the an accelerated docket uh, in the in the court system? Senator, any any possibility of accelerating these decisions would help with, with the predictability question I talked about before, as would the ability to have these cases heard in the places where the project actually takes place. So you're talking about geographic as, as well as temporal. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the witnesses for being here. Ms. Speaks Bachman, if I could start with you. Your company, Invenergy, is planning a, a high voltage transmission line across my state called the Grain Belt Express. You're familiar with this, I'm sure. I am, sir. As I understand it, this, this line, if built, would carry electricity from western Kansas to Indiana. It would cut across, right across the state of Missouri, 200 miles from west to east, eight counties, and cover hundreds and hundreds of farms. I understand you're also now proposing a second transmission line called the Tiger Connector Line, which would run north and south uh, from uh, Monroe County down to Callaway County. Farmers in my state have expressed a lot of concern with the Grain Belt Express and the use, your company's use of eminent domain. So let me just give you a chance to say what your response is to farmers and, and rural homeowners in my state who don't want transmission lines running over their farms, preventing them from planting crops or having their land taken from them for corporate use. Sir, thank you for the question. I, I would say that community engagement is first and foremost in our mind when we're developing any type of project. Um, and in addition, what we are thinking about is what is the necessity to make sure that lights stay on and that we can improve the reliability and resilience of these communities as well as across these communities from one to the others. And that's why we find it very important that we look toward uh, a, a, the larger view of what is necessary in the communities, but then at the state level, and what is in the national interest. And that's why we are continuing to work with communities to make sure that they are, um, uh, that, that they are understand what we're doing and that they give us feedback as to how we should develop these projects responsibly. You say the lights stay on. Are, are lights gonna stay on in the state of Missouri from this project? My understanding is, as originally planned, the transmission line wouldn't benefit the residents of Missouri at all. Light staying on uh, across the entire country. We're talking about. Not but you're taking Missourians' land. land. I'm sorry. You're taking Missourians' land from them. And we are. And you've gone to court. Your company has gone to court, and sued Missouri farmers to take away their land. Now, this isn't speculative. I mean, you've actually used this corporate power, which frankly I'm not sure you should have, to seize land from Missouri farmers that's been in their families for generations. Well, sir, I would, I would actually say that I think about um, we would have power that would go into, into communities in Missouri. So I, I would just, I, I'm happy. That's to the new Tiger Connector line. So after, after it was pointed out that your original Grain Belt Express did nothing for the state of Missouri, then you came back and said, well, we'll, we'll add something more. So what, what commitments are you going to give the farmers and residents of Missouri today that they'll actually benefit from this land grab? Yes, sir. Um, since we, as Invenergy, have taken over this project, we have done uh, an inordinate amount of community engagement. We will continue to do direct in community en engagement. Uh, this project did not start with us, but we took it, took it on, and we took it on with the, with the objective to make sure that the communities are uh, well spoken to and well heard from in order to make sure. What are they going to get? Are, there, are Missouri farmers and residents, are they going to get lower energy prices out of this? Are they, what, what are, how are they going to benefit? You're, you're putting a huge transmission line across 200 miles of land in the state of Missouri. You have gone to court to seize the land from Missouri farmers. You're a private corporation, aren't you? Yes, we are, sir. But how much money are you making on this? I'd have to get back to you on that. Would you? I'm really curious because... You know, you've got Missouri farmers who, in many cases, these are small family farms. These are not massive corporate farmers. They, this land has been in their family for generations. They just want to be left alone and be able to farm. And you're a major corporation who's coming in here and taking them to court, literally, to take their land. And then the benefit they get from it is nothing, nothing for the state of Missouri. 
And you talk about the national good, so your message to them is, give us a big, rich corporation, your land, or we'll take it from you, and you should just live with it. Sir, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that's not the message that we're trying to... That that's what they're hearing. Giving. Um, and I would say that since we did take it, since Invenergy took over this project, we have we have changed direction of the of the of the project. We've changed the path of the project to suit the community's needs and the community's demands. So, will you pledge not to exercise eminent domain in the state of Missouri? I, I am not. I'm not authorized to. To that's a no. I'm not authorized to make that commitment, but I will certainly get back to you. You know, that I think would be the kind, if you want to talk about rebuilding trust here, I think if you as a, as a corporation would say, you know what, we're not going to take your land from you. You talk about outreach to the community and, and benefits to the community. Why don't we start with, we won't take your property. Again, I'm, I'm not, it's not clear to me why you as a corporation should have the power to seize their property. I don't think you should. That apparently, that decision's been made, and I guess you do. But uh, I would just say, if, if you want to rebuild some trust, number one, why don't you show something for the state of Missouri, for the residents there, that you're going to do for them? And number two, why don't you pledge to them that you won't take them to court to take away their land so that they can continue to farm and raise their families and have their livelihood? I'm sure you still find a way to make lots of money. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, let me thank all of you for your, for your time and effort today to be here and try to share your knowledge with us. We appreciate it very much. And uh, I think we all know it's a passionate, it's a passionate plea, but the bottom line is we need dependable, affordable, reliable energy, and we can do it cleaner and better than anywhere in the world. And I appreciate so much. So the members are going to have until the close of business tomorrow to submit additional questions for the record, and the committee stands adjourned.